Hi, folks. Thank you so much for being here today. We're really excited to be able to bring you Science in the City in a virtual format this year. Uh, as some of you know, we usually uh, take over all of City Hall and turn it into a big science fair. And so this year we're going to attempt to do that. So we're going to start off and uh, we're really excited for a great day. Feel free to jump off and jump back on as, as you're able to. First off, it is my pleasure to introduce Mayor Siddiqui, who is currently serving her second term on City Council and first as the Mayor of Cambridge. Mayor Siddiqui attended Cambridge Public Schools, graduating from Cambridge Ringe in Latin. While I have known about her, her passion for local activism and service for a number of years, a new fun fact I learned is that she co-founded the Cambridge Youth Council, which is now in its 18th year, and that's really amazing. I've been able to work with the mayor on a number of local challenge projects, and I've been so impressed by her commitment to our community. Mayor Siddiqui has promoted equitable access to education for Cambridge families, sponsored many community events, including Cambridge Digs Deep, and she continues to promote affordable housing. Most recently, she has worked alongside the city manager in leading the Cambridge community during the COVID-19 pandemic, including launching the Mayor's Disaster Relief Fund and increasing internet access to low-income families, to name just a few things. With that, I turn it over to the mayor to kick off our festivities today. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Jennifer, for uh, introducing me. And thank you for all that you've done. It's a, been a pleasure to work with you. Uh, I am really excited to be here with all of you today to kick off this year's Cambridge Science Festival. Uh, whether we know it or not, science is part of everything we do. Uh, and the Cambridge Science Festival is a fun and informative way to let you in on the science behind why and how clothing drives and wearing used clothes helps mitigate water waste that happens with fast fashion or how bicycles work and contribute to a cleaner and greener mode of transportation or even the complex workings of an emergency communication system when you dial 911. Science is everywhere. During the course of my term, my office has also been really invested in connecting Cambridge youth to programs that deepen the desire for scientific inquiry and the excitement for discovery through a partnership we developed with the Cambridge Housing Authority's Workforce Program and Elevate Youth, a nonprofit organization empowering youth from underserved neighborhoods through regular outdoor experiences with the support of positive role models. I even joined them on some of these adventures to identify different kinds of leaves in our parks, building birdhouses, and learning about the various birds that Cambridge call that call Cambridge home. It's so wonderful to see so many city departments participating in today's events. I'm so grateful for the Cambridge Community Development Department and as I said in the beginning, Jennifer, to you and your leadership for engaging our community uh, through this month long uh, events and activities that are multifaceted uh, that are multicultural and accessible. And despite this pandemic, there are so many ways we can still find connection to one another and to our natural world. And the explor exploration of science via Zoom is a wonderful way to do this until we can resume in-person festivals again. And I'm so excited for when that happens. So thank you for having me. Uh, here today and go science. And now I'm really um, glad to welcome our city manager, Louis A. de Pisquale, who I've worked very closely with throughout this year. And it's an honor and a privilege. Uh, the city manager uh, before becoming uh, the city manager was the assistant city manager for fiscal affairs in 2002 um, for after serving as a city's budget director for 20 years. So um, Louis has been uh, part of the city for a really long time, uh, and it's uh, an honor to be here with him today. City Manager? Good afternoon, everybody, and I, I want to thank the mayor for those kind words, and I will say one of the great successes I feel is the relationship the manager's office and the mayor's offices have. It really is a team, and we've worked incredibly hand-in-hand, -in -hand, and it's not needed ever more than during this COVID crisis, so I want to thank the mayor and her whole office for all they've contributed during this last year and a half, especially. So again, I just wanna take this time to welcome every, all of you to the 2021 Science Festival. As the mayor mentioned, I'm Louis Di Pasquale, the city manager. The Cambridge Science Festival has been an incredible partnership between MIT and the city of Cambridge 
in the Cambridge scientific community since 2007. It's an event that everyone here in the city looks forward to each year. While I wish I could be greeting you in person at City Hall, I am so pleased to be here with you virtually. This year's festival and today's Science in the City event shows how, how far we've come from where we were a past year ago. I was so disappointed when we had to cancel last year's festival because of the emerging pandemic. Because the Cambridge Science Festival is now a month long virtual event, we can all learn about science in new ways at any time for the entire month of April. And today's Science in the City event will give you a one of a kind look at the science behind the work we do here in the city of Cambridge. You will hear from city departments and programs that use science every day to solve problems and improve the lives of Cambridge residents. You don't have to look any further than the COVID-19 response to understand how important science is. Science powers our daily COVID-19 testing program and now science is driving the COVID-19 vaccinations. I wanna thank the many city departments and dedicated city staff who've come together to make today's event a reality. Jen at the Community Development Department has been an incredible leader organizing today's event. And I also wanna mention Jen in my office for all the work she's done. I wanna thank all the staff involved from Community Development, Public Works, Historical Commission, Water, Human Services, Immunity, Emergency Communication, Library, 22 City View, Animal Commission, and IT, and everyone else who's worked to make this a success. Like everything we do here in the city, it really is a team effort. I know that today's event will show how incredible city staff are coming together and collaborating with key external partners to put science in work in Cambridge. I also wanna thank the MIT Museum. I particularly wanna acknowledge Mary Cat for organizing this year's Cambridge Science Festival. This event is a big challenge during normal times and Mary Cat deserves special recognition for coordinating an entire month of events under such a challenging circumstance. Thank you. Finally, I know we are all looking forward when we can celebrate Cambridge Science Festival in person again. But until then, I hope to enjoy the Science in the City live event today, and I hope you will enjoy the remaining days of this year's Cambridge Science Festival. Thank you. Thanks you all so much. Um, we so appreciate the time you took. I know that you're very, very busy people. So thank you for that. We are launching our Science in the City Festival and we're so excited. Thank you all so much for being here today. We're really excited to have you. And I do just wanna let you know that we um, do have a change in our schedule and our next session is going to be talking about some of our youth engagement with the Glocal Challenge. The Cambridge Historical Commission had a last minute change, so we're not going to be able to see the Dewey and Almy collection today. That said, they are going to record it next week and we will put it up on our Science in the City website uh, and I'll put that link in the chat as well. Okay, so we are going to now turn it over to a couple of videos from the Glocal Challenge. So the EF Education Challenge is Glocal Challenge is a partnership between EF Education First, the City of Cambridge, and the Cambridge Public Schools. And we have been so lucky to be partnering with EF for the past six years. Um, this year, we we continue doing the work on our programming that we had started in 2019 and 2020. Um, we didn't host a new challenge given the pandemic, and instead the students continued their projects at looking at how we might address the global water crisis here in Cambridge. Um, the projects these young people came up with were just so cool. Um, one team, as the mayor was talking about, started um, trying to really figure out how much water is wasted if you're using clothing from fast fashion industry, which is like the, the sort of box stores. Um, I never would have thought about that as, in terms of the global water crisis. And it was so neat to have them talk about that. In a couple of minutes, you'll see a video about that. Another team um, really focused on climate change and how we're going to see more flooding due to severe storms in Cambridge. And they wanted to figure out how can we help our neighbors who rent to be able to 
prepare for that, to protect their homes from that flooding. You'll see a video from them. And then we also had a team who looked at the impact of eating less meat on water consumption and water waste. And you'll also see a video from them today. Later on, we will be able to test out a video game live with the faucet failures, one of the teams who also won the Global Challenge last year. Um, we're really excited for you to see all of this. And I am going to start off now with a video from Equality 5, one of our winning teams of the Global Challenge. Hi there, we're Equality 5, and our members are Ava, Aliana, Elena, and Elaine. Welcome to our presentation. The goal of our project is to educate how to mitigate the damage of flooding for Cambridge residents, specifically for Cambridge renters. Our project wants to give insight on easy, accessible, and inexpensive ways to reduce the harm to homes and valuables, as well as how to educate um, how flooding is a big issue in our city. Our name is Equality 5 because it combines water, this year's theme for local, through aqua, and the importance of equality, so equal rights, opportunities, environmental justice, etc. Together, it's equality. Also, we have to have five amazing people in our group, hence the number five. A lot of people know how to react in a fire, but not in a flood. So we want to change that so that people know how they can protect themselves in both situations. This is a video we made during the summer. Hello, we are Quality 5, a group of Cambridge High School students whose purpose is to raise awareness about flood risk in Cambridge. In 2010, there was a really severe flood that caused a lot of damage to homes, roads, and businesses. We hope we can teach Cambridge residents something so that they can be a little less damaged the next time there's a big flood. We've done a lot of research about flood damage prevention and we want to share it with you. This video has a few simple tips to help you prepare for flooding in the future and how to deal with flooding when it happens. This is Marina. She is new to Cambridge and lives in the Alewife neighborhood. This weekend she came home and discovered her apartment was flooded. She wasn't sure what to do. Her first call was to her property manager. In most cases, a property manager will assess the damages, call necessary professionals like plumbers, and make repairs. While the basement is still flooded, Rena should stay out of the basement because flood water can contain harmful bacteria. If she must go into her basement, she should wear rubber boots and gloves, and also avoid touching electrical wires and fixtures due to the risk of electric shock. When it's safe, Marina sets up fans and dehumidifiers. These help her dry out her basement. She also disposes of items damaged by flood water. Finally, she and her landlord create a plan for future floods. This includes elevating appliances, using clear plastic bins for safe storage, and turning off electricity at the breaker before a flood. Now she feels much more prepared the next time a flood occurs. Marina is not the only person dealing with flooding. Clifford is a resident of Cambridge, renting a house in Cambridgeport with his dog, Big Red. Clifford notices that whenever it rains, the streets outside his house are swamped. He wanted to find out why, so he did some research. He found out that Cambridge and Cambridgeport specifically are really vulnerable to flooding. He did some research about what he can do to make a difference. Here's what he discovered. Having grass and green space in your yard helps absorb rainwater, so it goes into the ground and not into the roads. Keeping gutters and storm drains free of leaves and debris helps rainwater flow away from buildings and into the drainage system. This means it won't collect in streets and basements. Clifford also decides to invest in some rain barrels. Rain barrels are large metal barrels that collect rainwater that can later be repurposed. This water can be used for things like watering a garden or washing a car. The next day, Clifford calls his landlord to talk about flooding. They discuss water damage policies, installing a sump pump, and all the other things they can do to prevent flood damage in their building. This is very helpful for him, and he feels like he's learned a lot. Thank you so much for watching. We hope you learned something about flooding and feel a little more prepared. So uh, my name is Eva and I'm going to be talking a little bit about our blue bike posters, which are one of our current projects. So um, we decided to kind of get the word out about flooding and how, and Cambridge's flood prevention resources, we we're going to make some blue bike advertisements. So there are blue bike stations all across the city and 
we decided to put ours in areas affected by flooding, uh, specifically in Cambridgeport near um, MIT. So we, we made some like posters that are pretty quick and simple to read, um, pretty accessible for anyone, regardless of how, how much prior knowledge I have about flooding. And you can read quickly on your commute to learn some really quick and simple facts about flooding. So the topics we're gonna cover are three things you can do to prepare for a flood, what areas are most at risk of flooding, and uh, what you can do to prevent flooding, and resources like this city flood map that Cambridge already has. So those are gonna be out this summer, so look out for them whenever you're getting your next blue bike. Hey, I'm Aliana, and another large component of our group is social media. So we wanted to use Instagram as a platform to share our blogs, bus advertisements, and updates, facts, stats about flooding in Cambridge, because we thought Instagram is a great way to connect with organizations, people, and learn a lot of new information, which is why we thought it would be a good platform to use. Also, we can reach, reach a lot of people and advertise our website on there too. And then also echoing what was said before, talking about the tips and tricks and how to mitigate the damages of flooding. So our social media is at underscore equality five, and we would definitely recommend you follow and then tell your peers, your friends, your family members, uh, coworkers, anybody to follow our account to go on a journey and to learn. Hi, my name is Alina. And to circle back to our mission statement and to echo what Aliana said, in two words, our goal with Equality 5 is to spread awareness. Awareness about flooding, about how common and damaging a problem it is, and about how relevant of a risk it poses uh, to our community. And as young people, and just looking at this tech revolution that we live in, social media and awareness spreading go hand in hand. So in terms of actually creating content for social media, we've aimed to prioritize easy to read modern graphics when graphic designing. And we use the platform Canva to, de to design posts. And so here is a super quick portfolio presentation of content our team has created. This is a social media thread and some of the thread pages about um, how to mitigate flooding. This was a poster about six flood water observing plants because of course plants are just a great uh, instrument of flood mitigation. They work, they observe the water and they are, are um, environmentally friendly and sustainable. This is five fascinating flood fun facts. Um, this was our first post on the Instagram. And this is flooding by the numbers. And you can see right here, it just again, illustrates how big of a problem flooding is. I mean, 98% of American basements will experience some form of water damage eventually. The, um, I think when you look at the numbers, the, the problem is quite evident. Um, and so these are just, these have been just a few posts of the many that our group has been working on. And of course, since creating this presentation, uh, our social media content has only grown. And I think I can speak for a lot of my team members when I say that we're really proud of what we've been able to accomplish so far regarding social media and motivated to create more, design more in the future. Of course, before the age of social media, there was and um, is journalism. And journalism, namely writing blogs and articles, have been extremely effective mediums that allow us to go more into detail about flooding, as well as to create articles that are about flooding, yes, but not necessarily about flood mitigation or control. We'll get more into examples of such articles in a second, but our aim in creating a variety of flood related content is to present flooding as an intriguing and dynamic topic. Because let's be honest, you think of flooding and interesting and dynamic might be the last words that come to mind. We've tried to change this perception because activism begins with interest and interest is exactly what we've tried to generate. So one of my favorite projects I've worked on in Equality 5 has been the Floods of History series, which has included profiles and articles on the Central China Floods of 1931, called the deadliest of all time, and rightfully so, uh, the Great Boston Molasses Flood of 1919. I did a series of uh, flooding in mythology and religion, and I just loved researching uh, all these cultural flood-related stories so much. I made a part two. 
Um, and then outside of the series for the holiday season, I made a blog article about flood related gifts, um, as well as an article about different types of flood and an article about that relationship between climate change and flooding and about why uh, as humans, we are, we seek for ways to kind of deny it. So a very interesting article. Um, and I can't stress enough how much I've loved writing these blogs and how much they've developed and improved my writing skills. And of course, I've got to learn so much about all things flood related in the process. Also, since creating this uh, presentation, we've added six more blogs to our collection, um, ranging from topics such as China's sponge cities to flood mitigation during the medieval period. Um, but now I'm going to invite all of my wonderful group members to share what blogs they've worked on. Um, I've seen a few of them in our shared folder and they're incredible, so good. So get excited for that. Um, okay, so it's kind of hard to pick a favorite because they're all really good. But I think one of my favorite ones that I've done is like um, flooding in like historic buildings because like um, I live in like a historic type of neighborhood. All the buildings are pretty old, so um, it was really interesting doing that research and it was kind of a niche topic, but um, I loved like the old documents and it was really interesting. One, I think, uh, oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, I think the favorite one that I did was when I interviewed my landlord because I'm a Cambridge vendor and I did not realize how big the flooding was an issue and it was a really good conversation we had and I learned a lot about how she had really considered flooding when purchasing um, the apartment and how much she actually had planned. I didn't realize that she had taken that much into consideration and that um, flooding was such a big impact for renters and landlords in Cambridge. So I thought that was super cool. Yeah, and one of my favorite blogs that I worked on was, it was talking about the impacts of flooding, you know, economic, social, health impacts to be exact, and how it can lead to diseases which are unsafe to the environment and also the human body and damages which cause people and communities to invest more money in fixing you know structures or items lost uh and also the blog was talking about the environmental racism component and how flooding disproportionately affects bipoc people and we how we also can see this in places like cambridge as well so that was definitely really important to work on and i was glad that i had the opportunity yeah, I think um, our articles, they give us a place to talk about a lot of different issues. And again, present flooding through its intersections with other issues um, and through, I guess, in a lens that really illustrates the depth of its impact and uh, what it does to, communi to communities. So this is talking about our future. Where can Equality 5 go next? We have some amazing ideas that I would love to dive into. One being outreach through community events, a component that we have been missing um, due to COVID-19 and making sure that we follow safety protocols. And an example of the future when things start to get a little bit better is um, using Starlight Square which is a community place where people can interact and learn and see people's talents and so on and so forth. Also collaborating with other organizations focused on flooding and the impacts it has on residents because something our group really values is learning from the experts and other people um, because there's just some things that we don't know and that's okay. Also interviewing flood and climate change experts and featuring them on our website to hear the knowledge that they have been learning and spread it within our residents and people, our inner circles and also outer circles like school, for instance. Lastly, creating spaces on Zoom where our community members can learn tips and tricks on how to mitigate the damages of flooding just in case we wanna have that personal connection and we can't go 
outside like Starlight Square, instead to create a safe place on Zoom where people can just learn and making sure that we can advocate for our advertisements to be seen and spread awareness through communities. And that is it for our presentation. Uh, we hope that you are interested in our project. And again, we've just loved this opportunity to talk about what we've done and where we're going. We're gonna watch one more really quick video, and then we're gonna turn it over to our lovely folks over at Emergency Communications. I don't wanna start you all. I know you're here already, but I don't wanna start it too soon because there's probably people coming. So say hello to Emergency Communications, and then we will be bringing them on in just 10 minutes. So thank you all for being here. So I'm gonna turn it over to one more video about um, meatless, um, eating meatless and what that can do for your water waste. It's another winning project of the EF Global Challenge. And this group is called Project Green Plate. Raps is basically like a family owned business that uh, my father founded about nine years ago. So 2012. Yeah, and the menu is basically 100% uh, vegan, vegan options. So many good things that come along with, with like having a vegan diet and they just kind of can be things that you didn't even think about when you decided to go that route. And I think, you know, one of those would be uh, the water consumption aspect for sure. Um, so thought there might be an opportunity uh, to do something else, which was open a vegetarian restaurant. All right, so that was our Project Greenplate. They have been working on um, educating the CRLS, which is the Cambridge Ringe and Latin School community about eating um, more vegetarian and less meat to reduce their water waste, um, which is really neat. And it looks like we do actually have enough time for you to look at one more Glocal Challenge video before we bring on emergency communications. This one is by the Thrifting Project. They're a really cool group that looked at how fast Fast fashion impacts the water, not just water pollution, but the water waste in our world. And they've got a short five minute video for you about water waste. And then we will bring on emergency communications. Most people think of wasting water, they picture a faucet leaking or a long shower. But there's something in your house that wastes even more water than your plumbing, your closet. Fast fashion is the industry that produces tons of low-quality clothing as cheaply as possible. It has a huge impact on the environment, and especially on water. Let's go through the process of making a simple cotton t-shirt. First, the cotton plant is grown and watered. It takes 715 gallons of water to grow the cotton needed for one t-shirt. That's what you drink in three years. 99% of cotton is not grown naturally. The cotton industry uses 25% of the world's insecticides, more than any other crop in the world. These chemicals often get underground and contaminate the water sources farmers need to drink. 
After it's grown, the cotton seeds in puffs, known as bowls, are separated with a cotton gin. They are taken to a mill, where they are processed into yarn and woven into fabric by machines. Next, the cotton is bleached, treated, and dyed, using and polluting hundreds of tons of water. That water is used, contaminated, and often dumped back into rivers, causing widespread pollution. Synthetic dyes can cause health problems for people who drink from those water sources and work with the machines. Fabric dyeing uses 1.3 trillion gallons of water a year. That's one and a half million Olympic swimming pools. After it's dyed, the fabric is taken to a factory to be cut and sewn into a shirt. During this process, about 15% of the fabric ends up on the floor as scraps. These factories also have terrible working conditions, such as poor pay for up to 16-hour shifts, and sexual assault. At this point, the t-shirt is finished and it is shipped to the customer. Much of the shipping is done overseas and releases 1.2 billion tons of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere every year. Now the shirt is in your hands. Every time you do a load of laundry, you use 20 gallons of water. Every time you dry your clothes, you use 40 gallons of water. The average American household does 300 loads of laundry a year. That's 18,000 gallons of water per family. Fast fashion has lasting effects on the environment. Take the Aral Sea. It was once the fourth largest lake in the world. Now it's almost gone. It dried up due to farmers using its water for cotton irrigation. Now the salty, dry canals absorb water meant for crops. This causes poor harvests. The once thriving area is now dry, full of chemicals, and poverty-stricken. This crisis is huge for the environment, but you can help. Shop at thrift stores. When you buy from a thrift store, not only are you boycotting fast fashion, you're also extending the life cycle of a piece of clothing. Repair and reuse. Repurpose those old jeans into a rag. Or a bag. Recycle and donate. When you are done with clothes, donate them to thrift stores or shelters so that someone else can make them last the way you did, or give them to a textile recycling center. Remember that we can make a big impact in a small way. Visit our website for a list of Boston thrift stores by price and weekly challenges to repurpose old clothes. Thanks for watching! Thanks everybody for, for watching our youth programs. Um, the Glocal Challenge, just as a reminder, is an annual competition that is a partnership between EF, Education First, the City of Cambridge, and the Cambridge Public Schools. And we uh, ask students to come up with a solution locally to a global challenge. In 2020, this is what the students came up with, and they have been working really hard all school year. So now, if we are ready, it's the moment everybody has been waiting for, and I'm going to bring emergency communications on. Are you all ready over there? I'm not sure if they can hear me. <laughs> we can yeah, hear you. All right, good. So now we're going to bring you all on. I'm going to spotlight your video. There aren't a ton of folks here, so maybe we can make up some questions. Um, but to any 
does anybody have any questions? Or actually, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? We can um, hear a little bit of background and then we'll open up to questions from folks. Sure. Um, good afternoon, everybody. How's everybody doing? Uh, my name is Franklin Elison. I'm a dispatcher here at 911. Uh, Cambridge 911. I've been dispatching for about five and a half years now. Um, and yeah, you know, it's a hard job. It's not an easy job. Sometimes it can be a thankless job, but it's a job that needs to be done. And everybody here takes um, a lot of pride in doing it and keeping the city safe for you guys and whoever may be coming into it. I might have to think of some really good ones. And I can also start off by uh, giving you guys a couple of stats that we have. Maybe it you know, might get the juices flowing. Um, we currently have about 34 people in our department, uh, eight supervisors, uh, one director and two assistant directors, and also an admin assistant. And... Uh, you know, everybody does their part to make things flow kind of smoothly here. It gets pretty chaotic. But again, the whole goal is to make sure that you guys are getting the proper service and help that you need, especially when you dial 911. Um, that's very difficult for a lot of people to do. Um, statistically, one in like nine or um, few people will dial 911 or have uh, are hesitant to do so. So whatever we can do to ease that process, we try to. Uh, we take both emergency and non-emergency calls. So oftentimes people will uh, call our business line or 911 vice versa and think that, um, you know, they got to the wrong place or they should be connected somewhere else. So if you're ever that person, you know, don't feel nervous or anything. We will be able to help you out on both lines, even though we do often try to tell people to call 911 for 911 emergencies. But you will be assisted uh, on either line. And um, we send out police, fire and medical responses. So, um, again, we're lucky here because it's all kind of packaged in together. A lot of um, other dispatch centers aren't like that. So um, it does come in handy a lot. A lot. We're all in the same room and communication is very key here. So that becomes a, a pretty helpful tool, just having everything in the same place. Um, our call volume, we dispatch about 1,200 to 13, oh, excuse me, 12,000 to 13,000 um, wired calls annually and about 30,000 wireless or so cell phone calls um, every year. And then we also have the capability to answer your text messages through 911. A lot of uh, people in the public don't know that. So um, that's either a hit or miss, uh, at least for me personally, because um, I feel like I get the best information from actually talking to you on the phone. Sometimes we have to play the role of uh, detectives and pull out the information, depending on what kind of caller we're dealing with, whether it's a child or somebody who may not be able to speak or speak very well. So it, it's all depends on the situational. But uh, for me personally, text messaging, I think it's a very useful tool, but um, I like personally just speaking on the phone. Um, and we also have the E7 digit line, which is pretty much our business line. So hopefully that... Uh, Got the juices going. I, I did for me. I have a question. So cool. why is it, how does it work differently in Cambridge? Where like, you know how sometimes in other towns you do 911 and it goes out to like, you don't know where. How is it different in Cambridge and why? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, So in a couple of different PSAPs, so it's kind of based off the region. So say you live somewhere in New Hampshire that's pretty rural um, or even in Mass. Sometimes it goes to the state police department um, and or a center that will relay that call to where you needed to go your local agency um so then that's why you'll get transferred one maybe uh one maybe two times but in cambridge luckily we get all those calls directly um and a lot of uh centers don't do that so whenever you call 911 for the most part you won't have to deal with going through to state it will come directly to us and you'll get the uh, fastest service that you can and the same with the text messages. And again, just try to, um, if you can't call, then again, texting is a great feature that we do have, but we'll get all those directly as well. That is awesome. Thank you. We do have a question in the chat and it's, I'm wondering if you could, oh, this is exactly what I was just about to ask. So thank you so much for asking this one. Uh, I was wondering if you could comment on how cell phones play into dispatch. For example, I have a 617 phone number, but if I'm traveling and need to report an emergency, um, I go to the local 617 dispatcher who then had to transfer me to another location. Um, can you talk about that? And then I'll, and it, well, actually there's a little bit more on here that's um, also does GPS information on the phone impact how the calls get routed? Um, so the calls, that's, that's also a good question um, as far as cell phones go. So just to answer the first part of it, because you are out of town, a lot of the cell phone stuff just is based off of the cell towers of your service provider. Um, we also, 
and the supervisors also work closely with them, whether it's T-Mobile, AT&T, Verizon, um, just in case, say, we're trying to look for a missing person or somebody who's on the run. They have to work hand in hand with the cell phone providers in order to get an exact location um, because and I guess that's where GPS will come into play, because I think they're the ones with the actual GPS coordinates. Oftentimes on the initial call, we're getting the cell phone tower whether it's a phase one, which is could be a couple thousand meters from that tower, or um, we usually wait and give it about 30 seconds to a minute. We try to retransmit the call and then it gives us what's called a phase two call, which is a more accurate location. It's probably about 30, no more than 50 meters from where your phone is, but it isn't an exact location. So when we're trying to look for somebody who's missing or you know possibly kidnapped or whatever the situation may be where we want to get an exact location, uh, we'll have to go through the cell phone providers because um, they're the ones who will be able to provide your actual latitude and longitude and your current pings and they update us with that type of information. Um, so in regards to being out of state, I would say just try to, the best way personally I would say is to try to Google the possibly the business number for the agency you're looking for. Um, if you don't want to deal with being transferred or having to go through the uh, interagency things that might occur. That's great. And then when you call in, if you're out of state, what's the information you might want to give them since you're traveling? Um, since you're traveling, I would say first thing you always want to give is your phone number and your address. If you're traveling and the emergency is back home, uh, you want to give the address of where the emergency actually is. But address and phone number are the two things we always get from everybody. Um, and it gets, you know, if you're somebody who calls frequently, you might get annoyed because we always kind of ask you the same thing or it might sound scripted, but it's really for yours and our benefit because we can't help the way we see it. We can't help you if we don't know where you are. So we always initially start with the name and the phone number, just in case we do get disconnected for some reason. We can go through those channels I talked about, um, whether it's the providers or just trying to see where you hit off on the cell tower. Um, but yeah, you definitely want to let us know exactly where the emergency is, just in case we don't know what's happening. We can at least get people started there who will be able to figure it out once they get there. That's great. Thank you. Um, so what about what happens when a call comes in? So you said that it's you're really lucky in Cambridge because you're all together so you can communicate really closely with each other. What happens? Mm -hmm. So you make the phone call, it comes into you. And then what's the next step? Yeah, so the way uh, our room is set up for anybody who's uh, never been there, taken a tour, seen it at all, um, it's kind of set up in three parts. That's the way I like to see it in my head. The middle is where all the uh, initial contact goes. That's where if you call 911, uh, the call takers sit and they're the first initial point of contact for anything. Um, so, and depending on what your call is, we, like I said, dispatch police and fire. Um, so we will have two people designated to, for dispatching police um, on channel one and channel two. They'll, if you're, fa if you're facing when you enter the room, they will be on the left side of the room and vice versa. We also have the same uh, for fire um, and they will be on the right side of the room. Now, those call takers who initially answer the call are, are going to be certified in either side. But for the time being, they're going to be answering the phones and be that initial point of contact. So after that, we kind of after we do the steps that I've talked about, verified your name, your phone number or, or your address and your phone number. We can we go into figuring out what your actual um how we can actually go about helping you. And then depending on that, whether it's we, we determine whether it's a police call, a fire call, a medical call, and then it will be entered into our computer system and will go over to whichever respective side it needs to go to. But sometimes there are calls that require both police, medical, fire, all three. So it all, it all just depends. Um, so the call takers do a good job of figuring out what kind of incident type to put in there. And then it goes respectively to the side that it needs to go out to and then they'll uh, send it out to the responders on the radio. That's great, thank you. Um, what, has anything changed in the past year due to COVID-19 and how you operate? Yeah, a lot. Um, I'd say the biggest thing would be for the officers on the street. Of course, we all know COVID um, was very contagious and that's why you know we're going around wearing these masks. So a lot of reports actually are done over the phone now. Um, before we would send an officer out and speak to you and get the details of what's going on now, um, we gave the options for the citizens to be able to call in and we will get uh, brief details from them, see if it requires an actual response or if it's um, gonna be able to do what's called teleserve, which is pretty much a over the phone report call. So um, that's one thing that's really changed, just um, trying to social distance in the center. Um, it's, it, it's really difficult because uh, again, we're all in the same room, which pre-COVID is very beneficial, but as you can see, 
can easily cause some hurdles when we're attempting to social distance because we are all uh, kind of next to each other and can only be moved um, as much as we can. So that that was also difficult. And uh, a couple other things, I, I'd say more for the people on the street because um, we're, again, we're where we are. Um, but the guys on the street have had to uh, adjust their calls and how they're interacting with um, people out there. So definitely a myriad of things. Great. Thank you. Um, I had a question about, this is my, I work with a lot of young people in my job. And so this is my thinking about working with them hat for somebody who's looking to go into this kind of career. What, what do you need to do? What experience do you need? Well, uh, myself personally, I went to school for communications and business, but it wasn't any type of public safety communication. It was more like radio, media, advertising. So in my brain, I came into it just fresh and strep, um, just fresh. I would say just patience. Um, it takes it takes a lot of patience because I feel again, I've been here for five years, but I feel just probably in the past couple of months, complete control of my field. Um, and you're not going to get it right away. You're going to, you're going to fall, you're going to struggle, but that's also part of the learning process. So you just really have to be patient. You have to be able to listen. You have to be able to retain a lot of information because stuff moves very fast in there. Um, so you don't want to be asking too many of the same questions. You kind of want to retain as much as you can. That's what I would say. And just be vocal, communicate. And you just have to have a lot of thick skin too, because you're going to catch a lot of um, flack sometimes that's not intended for you. Um, so, you know, it's a lot, it's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of things to build, but I think honestly, I came in just such a blank slate that it helped me out. Um, I didn't really have to go from a different agency and see how to do things differently in this agency, which a lot of my coworkers have had to, we've had some people with 15, 20, 30 plus years of experience who at a different agency who have came, came here and we do things completely different. You know, they probably have come from a smaller agency where they don't dispatch police, fire, medical, but we do do that here now. Um, so it, it, it's a lot to take in, but I, you know, and it's definitely not for everybody, but I think everybody can come and at least try to do it. And if you are able to just, you know, be patient and um, listen and just retain, then nobody here will let you fail. You know, um, as coworkers, we just hold ourselves in high regards. And if somebody messes up, we just try to pick each other up as best as we can, because that's how we do most efficient work. Um, how does it work coordinating with your neighboring towns? So I know each town and city has something, a different way to do it. And I, you know, for example, I just heard that Everett's going to more of a system, kind of like what you have, where mm -hmm. things are done more in house than than others, but I feel like other towns around us do it very differently. So how does that work when when we're so transient too? You know, I might live in Cambridge today, but tomorrow I'll live in Somerville, and next year live in Malden. So how does that work? Uh, well, I think you know it's, it's it's on a case by case basis. I think it just depends on the service that you're trying to give or what the system needs. You know, it's it's easy to transfer somebody over to Somerville or like you said Everett or Belmont. Um, we do a lot of uh, radio chatter if we have to do that um, through what's called a Bayburn system. It's just an inter interpol network for um, local agencies around this area. I'd say not really too much North Shore, um, some South Shore, but just kind of Middlesex area. Um, and we do a lot of talking to them through that. We, uh, a lot of the people we frequently uh, or a lot of cities that we frequently deal with Boston because they're uh, connected to us, Somerville, obviously. Um, Belmont, Watertown, all the surrounding agencies, just because when something happens, um, say it happens in Watertown and somebody's coming into Cambridge, whether, you know, they're dealing with a medical issue or if it's a, um, somebody who has a weapon, we all need to know that. So Watertown will reach out to us or if it's vice versa, we'll reach out to them through that um, radio system because sometimes they might be tied up on their personal, on their business lines. So the radios are the ways that we use to communicate through interagency as well. So it's not, it, the radios don't just have the capability, the radio system doesn't just have the capability to go through um, our city. We can also communicate with, honestly, most of the cities in Massachusetts through uh, our radio system. So I'd say that that would be the fastest point of contact, but again, it's on a case by case basis. It's it's really based off of the service that we need to, um, to give. Cool, thank you. And how mm -hmm. many, how, I know you said the number of calls that you get, but how many, calls do you get a day like how does that translate down like a day in a week or 
I mean, it's, it's, it's tough, you know, and, you know, a lot of people think that, you know, Fridays are busier than uh, Mondays or Sundays are, are, you know, any type of call can happen at any time. And I think it's the same with the volume. Um, I think it, it, it changes a lot yearly because it's, you know, we just never know, like, especially on, with a year like this with COVID, a lot of people weren't calling for most of the year. So we don't know what our numbers are going to look like um, when we go back, when we go back in January. But I guess it would average around 300, 250 to 300. But again, it's it's all on a case by case basis. And with COVID, I think that'll change. It might be lower because again, less people were calling for about three to six months because we were all indoors and they didn't really have much to talk about. Um, a lot of the bulk of the calls that we got, of course, were, you know, domestics or disturbances or um, a lot of people dealing with some mental health issues because, of course, um, we're stuck in the house and we're all dealing with this unforeseen incident. Um, so that I feel like that just changed a lot to the types of calls we were getting. Um, but, yeah, in, in respect to that, I would say maybe 200, 200 to 300 a day. Wow. That is, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. So you need a strong team. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was just going to say. How many work. people work a day? Uh, work a day. So again, there's probably two to three call takers in the middle. There's always a floor supervisor that'll make about three to four. And then there's two people on um, the fire side and the police side. So about anywhere between um, six to seven at a time on the floor. And it, if, if we have special events, um that need extra monitoring they'll also hire overtime and put an extra person in the room sometimes they're designated to just do the radio sometimes they're designated to just answer the phones it all just depends what's needed yeah um can you tell us if somebody somebody were to call in what would your mm -hmm. i don't know what the word is your preferred what's the best way to give you the information like what's the best way for somebody calling you to get you everything you need to be successful uh, for me, it's I, I like when people just get right to the point. Um, it's not that I don't want to talk to you. It's not that, you know, uh, I'm mean or anything. I just like getting you the help you want to get as fast as possible. So I like when um, somebody calls in and say, hey, my name is, you know, John Doe. Uh, I live over here on McGrath Street or uh, Montgomery Street or Harvey or wherever it is. And this is what's going on, you know. Um, and it, right when you tell me what's going on, I can use my dispatch brain to kind of um, compartmentalize it and um, put it in for my team to get it out. So I like somebody who's um, direct. You're giving me as much information as you can for me to start getting it out. And then I usually work from there. If it's something where I feel like I need to do a little bit more digging, ask a couple more questions, then I, I really will um, say the person's being kind of vague and it's a, a scene safety issue, then I do a little bit more digging and try to figure out what's going on. But uh, yeah, I like somebody who's uh, direct can give me as much information as possible. Great, that's super helpful. Uh, so this question is, I imagine a lot of people who call in are in kind of stressful situations. Do you have strategies to get people to calm down, manage their emotions enough so they can focus and give you the info you need to actually help them? Yeah, a strategy. Um, and again, we go through when we get hired, we go through about a month academy and then we do about anywhere between three to six months training on the floor. So this is, these are all techniques that you develop over the course of time again. Th and that's where the patience comes in. You're not just going to get into it and um, just be able to handle a caller like that. It, it, it takes time and development. But a, a skill that we always develop is um, just to say a caller's name. Um, oftentimes I'll have somebody frantic, uh, like you were saying, um, in a stressful situation, and they're not even listening to what I'm trying to tell them. But I found that somebody always um, responds to, hey, what's your name? So I just try to repeat that as much as possible until they give me their name. And then after I just try to keep using their name as much as possible until they reach that calm point. Um, a lot of people also, what I've noticed is even if they're not, even if they're not irate when they're calling or they're not frantic when they're calling, they can get to that level when they feel like we we're not sending them the help that they want. So that's when we have to kind of use a technique called re, um, repetitive persistence. And we have to just reassure them that, you know, we are sending and this is why, and I'm asking you these questions for a certain reason. And that also helps calm people down a lot because they're getting that reassurance that, okay, help is on the way. This guy's not just lollygagging around. He's, he is trying to help me. He's just trying to get a little bit more. So those are two techniques that uh, I and a lot of people in the room use a lot. That's great. Thank you. I just got a private question sent to me. What sure. should I do if I call 911 by mistake? Oh, yeah. And that's a, 
that one's funny because you you get a lot of people who call and they think that we're gonna come arrest them or something because they dial nine one one. If you call nine one one by mistake, here's the thing that we we kind of do get annoyed about though. Stay on the line because if you hang up because you know whatever reason you're nervous. Again, like I started, a lot of people have never called nine one one before, so it's understandable. Just try to stay on the line because what happens is when you hang up. We have to try to go through that process of tracking you down now and making sure that you didn't hang up um, by force. You hung up accidentally. And we have to try to confirm um, that as best as we can. So by staying on the line, we just have that affirmation by hanging up. Then we have to go through certain channels, depending on what we hear in the background. And it just it just gets kind of messy. So if it is accidental, we just advise you to try to stay on the line as long as possible. Or uh, if you can, um, you're not in trouble or anything. It's, we just need that confirmation that you're OK. Great. Thank you. Um, and then I know earlier today you said, you know, people call 911 for lots of different things, even even things that aren't emergencies. Um, given that or regardless of that, what do you think are the be- what are the reasons when you really should call 911? Is that something you're allowed to say? <laughs> uh, the reasons? Yeah, just for um, emergencies, you know, um, you, you, you can always call 911. I mean, at this point, especially in Cambridge. A lot of what the citizens tell us when we speak to them on the phone is about how helpful and informative we are, um, even on 911. We, we're tough about it because we want to keep that line clear for people with active emergencies, but we're always going to try to be as helpful as we can. Um, definitely always call if you have an active emergency. I guess that's the best I can sum it up, where, whether it's medical or, you know, you, you see a disturbance or something like that. You know, see something, say something is it's like a double-edged sword for us. Because sometimes it's, it's kind of giving people a green light to kind of be nervous. But there's also been times where, you know, something, someone saw something strange and it did turn out to be something strange. So I think whenever active emergencies are involved, then definitely call. Don't hesitate. Um, but if it's not, it's something that you consider probably not active or could be handled on the business line. Um, I would say use the business line. Great, thank you. Uh, for folks, folks who are just joining us, we have about five minutes left with emergency communications. And so if you have any questions at all, please put them in the chat and I will ask them out for you. Um, I just got a private chat. Can the emergency communication center communicate with the speech or hearing impaired? Uh, yes, we can. We um, have what's called a TTY, so it's like a teletype. We actually have tests that we do um, every month just to make sure that we're all uh, certified and staying on our toes for um, the hearing impaired or um, people who have any type of disability that we need to um, communicate with them with. And we have a whole procedure um, that we go through. It's a whole different, um, honestly, kind of, uh, it's not a language, but cues that we use um, for people who probably aren't able to type as long. Um, We just use short cues, kind of like text messaging, but in, in, a, in a different manner. So we do have uh, the capability and we are, tr- that's one of the things that they teach you originally in the academy as well, how to deal with certain uh, callers with disabilities. Cool, and then similarly, I got a follow up. What about people with, who speak different languages? Do you have different language capacity at the center? Yeah, they use me. No, I'm no. just kidding. I speak uh, Haitian Creole, so it helps a lot. Um, but yeah, we also have hang uh, language line capabilities so we can communicate with whatever uh, language you mean. It's, uh, excuse me, need. It's pretty much a, a agency um, dedicated to that. So they hire uh, people who speak a bunch of different languages across the world and say it's a language that, say you call 911 and you don't speak English or even have the capability to tell me anything in English, I'll be able to call that language line. And even if you're just speaking in the background, they'll do their best best to attempt to interpret what language it is and they'll get us in touch with that interpreter. So a lot of the calls we get are from um, Spanish speaking callers, of course. Um, so we, we have... Um, couple of dispatchers in the room who speak Spanish, but when they're, we we're, we go by off a group ba- group based system. So if that group isn't working, um, then we have to utilize the language line a lot to speak with them. And uh, also callers calling from everywhere. So language line is definitely one of the most useful tools in our system. That's great. All right. So what about uh, digital phones, like internet phones and voice over internet? Does that work? Yeah. And uh, thanks for bringing that back up because that was, um, what I was going to say when the gentleman asked the question about being out of town, um, if you have a voice over phone, it definitely works. And we can always tell if it's a voice over IP, a VoIP that we call it. Um, we can always tell if it's calling from a VoIP. What you want to be careful with, though, and again, tying it back to that gentleman's question is when you're out of town, 
um, you and you have it, say you have an emergency, but it's where you currently are, but you're calling from your VoIP phone. They're going to get it as if you're calling from Cambridge. So say you're in Minnesota or Montana or wherever you are and you're all the way across the country, but something's happening there, an emergency, and you want to get help where you are, they're not going to be able to ping that if you're calling from a VoIP because it's going to come exactly to Cambridge still. So the IP is going to be wherever your IP address is uh, listed to. So you just want to be careful with that if you're ever calling from a, a VoIP and you're not um, in your hometown or at home. And that you just tell them when you when you talk to them, I'm this is where yeah. I'm coming from, but. Yeah, oftentimes it's it's. It's going to probably be where the VoIP is, but I always try to make sure I, I double check just because I know uh, situations. And again, we're trained um, on those situations that have happened. So I just try to refer back to the training as much as I can. And when I see a VoIP, just try to uh, make sure that they're in Cambridge. That's great. Do you have anything last minute you'd like to tell us? Um, no, no, you guys are great as far as citizens go. Um, again, just feel free to call. I know. A lot of people are scared or uh, nervous to call 911 or emergency communications, even just to ask for information. Um, we're always here. We're open 24 seven, um, especially downstairs. The police department are also very helpful. And uh, yeah, just feel free to reach out. You know, nobody up there is going to yell at you immediately on the phone for asking a question or anything. Um, and we're always just here to help. So we're here for you guys and feel free to utilize us. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. It doesn't look like we have any more questions, so we'll let you go. Uh, thank you. And tell Skip we say hi because we see his name on the bottom of your screen. <laughs> and thank yeah. you so much for spending time. Thank you, Jim. I will. All right. No bye -bye. Anytime. Yeah. All right, folks. Um, for those of you who are joining us, we are in the middle of our Science in the City online virtual event, and we're so excited to have you all with us. We have just a minute before we bring on All In Energy, who is working for the Cambridge Energy Alliance. They can give you lots of information about programs that we have available for you. Hi, we're Project Greenplate, and we're happy to introduce you to our Meatless Monday Madness event. We at Project Greenplate focus on water conservation through people's diets. If we told you that over half of U.S. water each year goes towards meat production. Would you believe us? So what is this incredible event you ask? It is a night of community building, interaction, through cooking demos, games, trivia, an expert talk, and much more. And this is all in 45 minutes. Join us Monday, April 26th from 6 o'clock to 6.45 p.m. on our YouTube channel. And feel free to scan the QR code on the screen right now so you can enter our event on Eventbrite and also our raffle. Our core goal is to build a community of water conscious people with varying backgrounds that can all make informed choices and differences in their respective lives. This is why our target audiences have ranged from second graders to adults, from consumers to the cooks. If you want to join this ever growing community, make sure to attend our Meatless Monday Madness event April 26th at 6 p.m. We look forward to seeing you there. All right, so you you can join us on Monday at right after work. I don't remember what time they said, so I'll put it in the chat. Um, and you can get together with some Meatless Monday connoisseurs. All right, so we're going to turn it over to Gabe and Francesca from All In Energy now. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so welcome to the City and Cambridge Energy Alliance's panel on sustainability presented by us, All in Energy. We are incredibly excited to be a part of today's event. Um, we will be talking about one sustainable action you can take to reduce your carbon footprint in honor of Earth Week. We'll go through many actions you can take, but uh, you only have to take one. Uh, but before we get started, let's meet our presenting team. Uh, so yeah, hi, I'm Gabe Shapiro, uh, co-founder and co-executive director of, of All in Energy. We, um, as you'll learn in a minute, are a, a nonprofit that was that I helped found a couple of years ago, and we've been uh, partnered with the City of Cambridge for the last couple of years, really helping make sure all Cambridge residents um, are aware and have access to all the state and uh, uh, utility energy efficiency and renewable energy programming that we have here in Massachusetts. 
And I am Francesca Resnick, and I am the new City of Cambridge Program Manager. So I will be helping All In Energy and the Cambridge Energy Alliance with an expanded partnership to ensure everyone in the city has access to the entire range of programs we're about to talk about. So All In Energy is an official and trusted partner of the city. Our mission is to accelerate an inclusive clean energy economy and also to diversify the clean energy workforce in Massachusetts. That means helping everyone get access to energy saving programs, affordable renewable energy, and empowering minority and bilingual professionals to break into the clean energy space. So you're interested in sustainability and you want to get started. What should you do? The first action that you can take is to call us. We have a Cambridge Energy Bill hotline where we can set you up with an energy bill audit. We can also connect you with the Mass Save No Cost Virtual Energy Assessment. More information on that in the next two slides. Through the energy bill audit, we can help you save money and become more energy efficient. One big way to do this is by removing nonsense third energy suppliers that are essentially scamming you out of your money and providing you with no actual service. Yes, yeah, that's the, the energy bill audit, the first thing that we offer. Um, so when you call us, we can offer to do the energy bill audit. Um, and with this audit, we can get you off third party energy suppliers. We can inform you if you are eligible for the income reduced rate, what other low income and or energy efficiency programs you qualify for, and if you qualify for community solar, which we'll talk about more in a minute. Soon, these bill audits in Cambridge specifically will also be able to assess if you live in a home eligible for PV solar installation. But the best and first sustainable action you can take is participating in the Mass Save program through the no cost energy assessment. So this program um, is part of the state funded program and they offer a no cost home energy assessment that is performed by an energy specialist. They assess your home and your energy needs at no cost to you. They do it completely virtually. And after this assessment, they can tell you what you can do to make your home more energy efficient. This is available to renter renters as well as to landlords. And they provide several avenues use to save money and energy. You can receive free LED light bulbs, but this offer expires at the end of 2021. So take advantage of it while you can. Um, currently, the sponsors of Mass Save are offering 100% off approved installation for a limited time for all rental units and one to four unit buildings. Single family homeowners and single unit condo owners can get 75 to 100% off approved installation based on income. All of these benefits are offered to reduce the use of energy, especially in Massachusetts, a cold climate. This installation can help you save so much energy energy and drafty homes. So after you participate in a mass save energy assessment and you make these energy efficiency changes in your home, what can you do next? Um, and this light bulb is not an LED light bulb, nor is this one. Um, and you would theoretically have gotten rid of those in your mass save energy assessment. So if you want to go beyond energy efficiency and are interested in getting connected to renewable energy and making your carbon footprint even smaller, Cambridge offers quite a few different options. So the first one is the ability to opt up to 100% renewable energy. So this program is offered through the Cambridge Community Electricity Program, um, and they offer two options, which will be on the next slide. So these two options are the standard green and the 100% green plus. Through both of these pro programs, you are adding clean electricity to the New England electricity grid. Participants in both programs are supporting the development of a new solar energy project in Cambridge through a small charge. And then once this project is up and running, all participants will receive renewable energy from this project. So as a result, all program participants will receive additional, additional renewable energy above the minimum amount required by the state of Massachusetts and will help to displace fossil fuel-based power production. Even more, the standard green plan in Cambridge is actually cheaper than Eversource's basic service. 
Now, most programs that we offer at All in Energy are about saving you money because we tend to work with low income populations. But if this doesn't describe you, opting up to 100% renewable is a great way to go greener. If you want to completely decarbonize and you choose to participate in 100% Green Plus, that means that 100% of your energy will come from verified renewable sources for only a few dollars a month more. This is an easy way to take an action that you can be completely confident is actually making a difference. Now, the other option is solar. So let's talk about solar because there are a lot of ways to get involved with solar power in Cambridge. The first is the Sunny Cambridge Initiative, a program through which you can get a free solar quote and then be linked up with all of the other solar options available to you. If you have specific questions about how the Sunny Cambridge program works, we can answer those in the Q&A. Now, the options that are available to you in Cambridge include a bunch of different community solar options, as well as solar PV models. We can help you through the solar decision-making process and installation, as well as solar financing by connecting you with the Mass Solar Loan Program. Additionally, the city also offers solar hot water through one of our partnerships. Now, lastly, I'm going to talk about electrification. So one of the great organizations the city is partnering with is also helping us implement our new clean heating and cooling program through the use of air source heat pumps. Getting this heating and cooling system is a great next step after participating in the Mass Safe program and getting your home weatherized. This program is an important part of our transition to efficient electric heating instead of fossil fuels and will help us reach net zero carbon emissions in Cambridge, especially as we increase generation of electricity through renewable energy like solar power. That means that this is something that is great to do in conjunction with solar panel installations, community solar, or the previous opt up to 100% renewable program. If you did all of this in conjunction together, you would basically have a carbon neutral home. The second option, if you're interested in even more fully electrifying, is electric vehicles. The Green Energy Consumers Alliance has a drive green program available in Cambridge that can help you purchase an electric vehicle at a discounted price. This program is easy and haggle free. And if you buy an EV, you are eligible for both state and federal rebates. At the moment, the city of Cambridge has several city owned charging stations offering a level two charge, which makes Cambridge a great place to own an EV. We just gave you a whole lot of info very quickly, but for more details, you can visit the Cambridge Energy Alliance website or call us at All in Energy. We'll be happy to put you in the right direction with our fantastic call team and get you started on your sustainability and clean energy journey today. Um, does anybody have any questions? Um, I can get us rolling as you suggested, Jen, with a question uh, that I might also myself answer, but well, uh, <laughs> um so I, I was, uh, when, when, when Francesca was telling us about the Cambridge's aggregation program, um, I was just wondering if I, had to, if I, as a Cambridge resident, would have to do anything to enroll in just the basic green um, portion of the program. And um, the answer to that is you, you don't have to do anything. You, um, when, when Cambridge adopted the aggregation, everyone who was on Eversource Basic Service was added to Cambridge's aggregation. And as you can see, that is not only greener than Eversource Basic Service, but also cheaper. So that's a definite win-win for, for all the residents of Cambridge. Um, the important, uh, the people that were left out of that is if you were already on a third-party energy supplier, um, Cambridge wasn't able to bring you into the aggregation. So we have met people in Cambridge who are still not only paying more than they would be on the aggregation, but paying more than Eversource Basic Service because they signed up for an aggregation of a, a third-party energy contract um, and weren't really aware that they did it or didn't know that it was extended. So um, that's one of the things that we wanted that we're happy to cover with this like energy bill, quick energy bill checkup is like just to make sure your bill is in good shape, that you're not, there's nothing harmful on there. And then to help help you help you if you would like to access some of these other uh, other programs um, that the that the city has to offer. So just wanted to clear that up that if you are a resident and pay an electric bill, you are likely already enrolled in the, the, the Cambridge Basic Green um, program, which is saving you money and is also 
greener than what you would get otherwise if you lived outside of Cambridge? That's a great question. Thank you, Gabe, for that. And then we have another question as well, is that solar companies can feel quite confusing to navigate. How do you know the most reputable provider to talk to? Yeah, that is a great question. And I think one of the reasons that All in Energy has to exist is that there are, unfortunately, like disreputable energy companies in, out in the space. So people, we, we see this really as a role is to help people cut through all the noise and all the like unscrupulous and bad offers that they're receiving to really connect them to the, to the best, to, to things that are good, gonna be good for them that the city is endorsing and that, um, and that, uh, and that we know are, are not gonna take advantage of people and offer them good, good products at good prices. So the city solution on solar for that is partnering with um, Energy Sage which is um, a solar portal where uh, you put in your address and then you receive multiple quotes from solar providers. Now those solar providers, one of the role that Energy Sage is playing is they've already vetted all of the, the solar companies that are on their website. So you know, not only you're getting a good price because you can see the different comparisons, but you already know that Energy Sage is like staking their reputation um, on the fact that they've vetted all these solar providers. So that's a great way to kind of just like, you know, proactively seek quotes that you know are coming from reputable providers uh, and they do, a, they, they do a great job. Um, my, I, I, you are gonna get more than one quote, so it might make it a little bit difficult to like navigate that. But another thing that they do and the Sunny Cambridge program does through them is they provide you with like a guide that can help you like understand them and compare them. So it's not only just like you get a bunch of information, they're also providing additional support um, and then not every not every roof is good for solar. So we have these other ways that you can access renewable energy either by opting up easy through the through the aggregation though you have to pay a little bit more. Or um, there are some community solar options as well that serve Cambridge. Right now, uh, the city is promoting something that is only um, can only benefit people who are uh, on the reduced uh, rate because of income. Um, or importantly, if there's some um, census tracts in the city that allow you to qualify as well. So if you're interested in that, and that's a program where you get a large, you, you get a discount um, and access to, to 100% renewable energy through, through community solar. Um, so that's a great program as well. And we can, we can if you call our, our helpline, we can help you look up your address to see if you qualify uh, for that. Or if you know that you are on that reduced electric rate, um, we can contact you at that directly as well. Great, thank you. And a few new folks have joined us. So we are now with All In Energy to talk about the Cambridge Energy Alliance and any renewable energy or energy efficiency programs that you can take advantage of as a resident or business owner in Cambridge. We also have a solar map in Cambridge that we work on with MapDwell. So I put that link in the chat as Great. well. And um, the solar map, you can put in your address and you can go directly to um, to, to whether it will say it will look at your map at your your address and it will tell you how good your building is for solar um yes so the right, question the, is if we wanted to make one change what change has the biggest impact yeah that's a great question um and i don't know that there's like the simplest answer to that um we the, the, the biggest contributor, the biggest uh, contributor to energy use that we have in our sort of Northeast climate is our heating. Um, so really tightening up the envelope of your building is, is probably has the most impactful, um, can have the most impact on, on, on the, like reducing your personal carbon footprint um, at, at home. Uh, I think, you know, second, secondarily your electric uh, bill is, is kind of the, the second uh, place where you're, you're producing the, the second most amount of carbon. So some of those uh, renewable energy options and um, opting up are, are kind of the secondary steps, but kind of what we were, where we really look at this, uh, the mass save like nation leading energy efficiency program as the best place to start to really make sure that we're just not wasting, you know, the fossil fuels that we're burning for heating our homes um, and making sure that those envelope, uh, the envelope you're building is, is tight. It also has like these benefits of making your home more comfortable after you like um, seal it up. So you feel less drafts and there's no fewer cold spaces in your home. Um, and, and, you know, we'll, we'll save you money as well. So that's the, that's what we think is the, is the best place to start. Um, but not everybody can do that. And uh, you know, if you want to 
go down the path of, of the renewable energy also. All of these are great actions that have a, have a real impact um, for you to take. I have a question. Yes. So, and I know Francesca talked about this in the presentation, but I would love to hear a little more about it. I get so overwhelmed by how many emails and pieces of physical mail I'm getting from all of these third party companies. And to the point where sometimes I don't know that it's a third party company. So what, what, how do you deal with that? Like, what is your advice on what, what we should be paying attention to? And I know we can call you, but I don't know if that's the most effective either. Yeah. Um, so you are welcome to call us if you have any question about anything you receive in the mail, like we can definitely talk to you. The advice that I give people is to ignore every piece of mail and overture they get from any, any energy company that's unsolicited. Um, even though we are often in the field with, with kind of that message, but you know, because all energy is partnering with the, the city, um, you should definitely look out for pieces of mail or messages that have the city's brand on it. I think you can really like get the, the we're, we're really trying to connect people to these beneficial programs. Um, but the things that you get in the mail are often um, sort of misleadingly branded as being part of coming from the utility. So like coming from Eversource directly um, and things that you can definitely look at and react to things that come from Eversource. Like they are obviously gonna connect you with legitimate programs that they offer. Um, some of the similar ones, sim many of the same programs that we would be trying to connect you to. Um, but the, the, the offers that you get are often um, greenwashed. So they, they sound like they will also be connecting you to a more sustainable option, but they're you know, often not the same high quality local renewable energy credits that come from projects that are in New England, that the that Cambridge holds, the, the, the city holds themselves to a much higher standard for what they count as being green. Um, and they're often like misleadingly priced. There's often like bait and switch kind of offers where you sign up for an introductory offer that is you know, lower than what you might be paying on the Cambridge aggregation for a few months, but then they rely on the fact that people don't look at their bills and then the you know your the rate goes up and they just you know you, you're locked into some some new rate. Um, the attorney general did a study on these third party energy supply contracts, uh, and they found that in the, at least in 2018, ratepayers paid something like 76 million dollars more than they would have normally if they were just on basic service. So we went through this process of deregulating the market to like create competition, but like it has not worked out that way. This is one of the like failures of the cap capitalistic model of uh, energy supply has like really just caused people to pay more because it, there's not, there's incomplete access to information. So um, I did this actually with a, an elderly Cambridge resident. She had collected all of the mail that she had gotten from energy companies over a year. And we, I, I was just like shocked at how many just letters, pieces of mail that she got. She was on a third party energy supply contract that she didn't remember signing up for. So we switched her back to, this was pre, pre-aggregation, switched her back to Eversource and now she's on the aggregation, but it is like, it, I, it can be overwhelming. And I think the best way to do it is to kind of tune it out if it's not from the city or from Eversource itself. But that's a great question. Thank you for queuing that up. Thank you. That's a great answer. And um, Councillor Nolan just put in the chat, everyone should opt into the 100% renewable option through aggregation. And so for folks who have just joined us, do you want to explain what that is again, so that we can, so that anybody who came on after your presentation, sure. can hear about that? Francesca, do you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. So um, for just $4, 4 cents more a kilowatt, um, you basically get all of your energy provided from renewable sources. Um, and this money is also going towards building new solar farms that will then supply the city of Cambridge. So um, you are making sure that the electricity that you get is 100% renewable. So reducing your own personal carbon footprint, but then also investing in helping the city eventually get to that point. So it's a win-win. If you can afford to opt up, there's really no reason not to. Right. And unlike those other offers, this is not greenwash. This is like highly valued premium local renewable energy credits that the city has vetted to make sure that there is actually they're actually having an impact. These are projects that like wouldn't be happening, but for the city support. So like this new renewable energy capacity that's being added to the grid. Um, 
and there's no like bait and switch nature. You'd lock, you lock in this higher rate, so you pay a little bit more than you would to get the, that uh, that clean energy, but it's not like going to change on you. It's very, you know, the rates are published and are locked in for long periods of time. Great, thank you. And for folks who are joining us now, we're here with All In Energy, and we're talking about the Cambridge Energy Alliance and all of the amazing programming that you can take advantage of. So are there other sustainable actions that you think, you know, this Earth Day week, we should be thinking about in terms of your homes that you haven't already mentioned today? Yeah, I, I, uh, I mean, there are definitely some like personal actions that you can take. I think actually right before we started, there was this PSA about, um, the sort of meatless Monday uh, action. And that is actually another huge, um, not home related uh, step you can take, which is reducing the amount of meat that you eat, um, which is like sort of not, I guess, a, I don't know if that was a formal city city program that, that the, the meatless Mondays uh, group is, is promoting, but that's, I think, yeah, learning how to reduce the amount of meat that you, you eat is one action that we did not cover because it's not really related to your home, but it does, can have an, an enormous carbon impact. Um, and that, that looked like a really cool session that they were putting on. I was going to say, I know Gabe composts, um, so if you can do that. Yeah. And actually that's a really good plug. So right after you all are done, we're doing that same PSA again so that folks can see it. So if you're interested in learning about that program, it is not an official city of Cambridge program. Um, we don't have that kind of a in your house cooking kind of a program, but it is a, an official city of Cambridge youth project. So there's young people who have created this amazing program. And then right after that, Mike, who some of you can see up at the top, will be talking about composting and waste reduction at home. So perfect, perfect plug there. I was just going to say, put up another plug in for this, this helpline that we have. So like, we're here, like, even if you don't want to, if you're not like calling to access one of these programs, you just have a question about your bill or you have a question about any energy related um, issue, whether it be, you know, sustainability related or not, like we're helping people access, I'll mention again, we'll help people access the like income eligible rates. Uh, we've helped people, I don't think we mentioned this specifically, help people connect. If you have a balance on your bill, an unpaid balance, Eversource has a great program that helps um, people stay in good standing and not get their, their bills shut off and, and, um, uh, and pay and, and supports pays like 75 cents on the dollar to, uh, to um, match your payments to help you pay down your bill. That's especially important as like we've had during COVID, there's been a moratorium on shutdowns across the state and that is ending at the end of July uh, or scheduled to end. So um, this is a, a great way if you are accessing the moratorium or are um, unable to pay your bills because you're prioritizing food and medicine in these times of COVID to kind of transition over to this uh, Eversources repayment plan um, to help you keep keep everything keep in good standing. Um, so just any questions about that? If your bill is confusing, if it went up, I've been working with some uh, a couple in Dorchester who had this huge spike in their electric bill, and we've been doing a lots of investigation, and we I, we think that there's a there's actually an outlet and another unit that is connected to their bill. So it took us a long time to get there, but if you have questions, we'll help you figure out what, what's going on. And we're here to help. And that's like one of the reasons we, we set up this helpline for, for Cambridge is just any, any energy related questions. We're happy to help you work through. The one program that I think we didn't specifically mention because this is more of a residential focused session is that we are working closely with small businesses in Cambridge as well to access um, access the small business turnkey energy efficiency program. Uh, so this, uh, if you know of any businesses or like there's a coffee shop that you go into often, um, they're, they're doing, there's an incentive through June where those small businesses can get um, in, like an enhanced up to hundred um, percent of the like insulation and energy efficiency work covered for them. So uh, there's going to be a campaign where there'll be some letters and some, some, uh, some boots on the ground from from both us and the and the vendor that provides those services to small businesses, but it's just another way that we really want to connect. Um, that's a, small businesses are another underserved population of the, identified by the state, um, so we'd love to love to help all those all those businesses understand that they can access some money saving programs, especially even if they rent their unit or uh, um, you know it might be a, a, a good way for them to to take advantage another program. Yeah, I guess as, as we're, I could just sort of do a recap of, of uh, the, the options that are there um, for the folks that have joined and, and maybe to wrap things up a little bit. Uh, so 
Um, we're here to help um, all Cambridge residents understand what's happening on their electric and heating bills um, and then uh, help them take sustainable actions that um, through programs that the city has vetted and endorsed. So um, there's everything from, from energy efficiency to renewable energy to electrification through air source heat pumps and electric vehicles. Um, and we really want to just make sure everybody in Cambridge is aware of all of these you know, public investments that both the city and the state and the, and the utilities are making into these programs and um, that allow you to take these actions that really, you know, in, in ways that will save you money rather than cost you money. Um, so you can visit the Cambridge Energy Alliance uh, website, has all the programs listed, um, or you can just call us, All in Energy, we're a 501c3 nonprofit that the city has hired to do this work and, and help residents connect to these services um, at the number there. And um, also to recap, I think the sustainable, the one sustainable action that we've been asking people to think about taking is explore uh, accessing the Mass Save program for your building. Um, and the Mass Save program serves all types of buildings and all types of uh, incomes. So we, we can help you get your building to the right place. And then also, um, if you have uh, you want you want to completely decarbonize your electricity, and you have a few extra dollars to spend each month opting up to Cambridge's 100% renewable energy option on the on the uh, Cambridge uh, the the Cambridge aggregation is another great way to like really you know quickly reduce your carbon footprint at an affordable um, vetted uh, non uh, no risk way uh, to to do something that's going to have an impact and and not cause any any more harm than a few dollars a month uh, extra on your electric bill. So those are the things that we sort of highlighted as a, a good first step, but um, definitely explore all the programs that are available at the, at the Cambridge Energy Alliance website or by giving us a call. Great. Thank you so much. I do just want to say that um, before folks jump off, we have a poll for you. And also, um, it is actually just a few dollars. I do it myself. And and I was a little bit nervous at first. Um, I was like, what am I getting myself into? But it is actually just a few dollars. So if you haven't done it, um, and you can afford that, please do. Great. So before we bring, I just want to thank Gabe and Francesca so much for being here. We're really happy you're able to take some time this afternoon. Thank you to all of the attendees. We're about to go into an awesome session with uh, the EPA and Mike Orr from the City of Cambridge um, and the Environmental Resource Group. So um, we're really pumped for that. We're going to turn it over to Mike and Ben. And um, you can share your screen if you'd like. And I'm going to mute and let you two take it away. Great. Thank you, Jen. Um, and Jen, we have uh, one other panelist, Sissy, Sissy Ma. She's in the attendees. Um, we could upgrade her. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Mike. Uh, I wish we could all have this event in person. We can talk and be in the same place, but it's great to see all the people uh, in attendance. So I'm Mike Gore. I'm the recycling director for the city of Cambridge. Um, uh, following me will be um, Ben Morelli and Sissy Ma um, to talk about our food waste program in Cambridge. So um, I've got a PowerPoint that I'm going to start sharing. Uh, and let's go straight into that. And then I, I also wanted to do a plug that I, uh, I also do the uh, opt up for 100% renewable energy, but I live in Somerville, but love it. Super easy to do. Plus I got all these LED light bulbs from uh, Eversource for free. So it just, I mean, that paid for itself right there. So anyway, um, but we're here to talk about food waste. Um, let me get this into a slideshow. So, um, uh, this, is, uh, this is one of my favorite photos. These are a group of kids giving away some compost bags uh, in West Cambridge um, just on a beautiful Saturday morning a couple of years ago um, to help promote our curbside compost program. So um, today we've got some really exciting information to share. Um, we're joined by the EPA and the Eastern Research Group. They um, conducted an analysis of different processes for managing food waste. Um, but before we get into that, I just want to talk a little bit about our program and then I'll kick it over to them. So, um, but as a, as a background, you know, why do we care about food waste? You know, what is the importance to this? Um, food waste is a very large contributor to climate change. Um, when food is sent to landfills, uh, a lot of methane is emitted. Methane is a more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, which is the most frequently heard of greenhouse gas. Um, so it contributes to climate change. And the reason why we're really looking at this at the residential sector is because the residential sector, sector produces the most amount of food waste of all sectors. So 
This is a, a graph provided by the US EPA on an analysis they did to figure out where is food waste coming from. And 40% of the food waste in America comes from residents. And separate of that, uh, it's kind of coincidental, we did our own analysis of Cambridge and we looked in our trash and we found that 40% of our trash could be diverted to our curbside compost program. So this is an incredible opportunity for us to really make a dent on, on climate change and you know, reducing the amount of food that's going to landfills and incinerators. So a little bit about our organic waste program. So um, dating all the way back to 91, yard waste was banned from disposal in Massachusetts. So we started composting yard waste starting in 1991. We do about 2000 tons of that each year. Um, fast forward to 2007, we started looking more closely at food waste um, in schools and at drop-off sites. So you could go to our recycle center, for instance, and drop off food waste, and we would take care of it to make sure it got composted at Rocky Hill Farm, which is where we sent food waste up until uh, 2018. So in 2019, we switched, uh, well, sorry, in 2018, we actually made the switch. Um, 2019 was our first full year of citywide compost where we did 1800 tons of food waste was sent to anaerobic digestion. Anaerobic digestion is probably something that most of you may not have heard of, or it might be a new term. So um, we'll go into a little bit of detail on that. But first I wanted to announce the curbside compost program was suspended due to COVID. Um, it's very unfortunate that we had to put a pause, but obviously safety and, and you know, getting, getting the pandemic under control was priority number one. But we're, we're pleased to say it's gonna return on May 17th. So in order to participate, all you need is one of those green bins you see in the curb or uh, in the photo and a kitchen bin, which both of those we provide for free. Um, you could visit our website um, to get that and, and you can also email us if you have any questions. So currently about 32,000 of the households in Cambridge have access to the program, um, but we only have about a 40 to 50 participation rate, 40 to 50% participation. So a huge opportunity to really make a big dent um, in the amount of trash that's, uh, that we're generating. So why did Cambridge change from composting to anaerobic digestion? So in 2018, as we were looking for a new facility to handle all of our food waste, we set some specifications that we needed to meet in order to launch this program at a citywide level. So we looked at, um, you know, we needed to have something that was less than 10 miles from Cambridge DPW. That's for operations reasons. We needed someone that had the capacity, a facility that had the capacity for 50 or more tons per week. Um, it had to be open. 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. Monday through Saturday, and it has to be able to accept a little bit of contamination in the, you know, off chance that someone puts something in there that's not the, the right stuff. Um, and, you know, we, we looked at all the different sites around us in, in the Cambridge area or in the Boston area, and the site that met all those specifications, there was only one, and that was the Waste Management Core Facility. So this is a really uh, fun photo of the big tank where all the food waste is stored after you know, universities, restaurants, um, food processors, and municipalities like Cambridge will send all their food waste to this facility in Charlestown. And they slurry it up. Um, and then they put them in these tanks before they ship them up to the Greater Lawrence Sanitary District. So step one, we haul the food to this facility in Charlestown. Step two, it goes to the Greater Lawrence Sanitary District. Step three, they process it in anaerobic digestion tanks. Um, they generate methane and they use that to make electricity and heat. And then the leftover um, solids are what we call biosolids. And those are dried and marketed for, for sale by Casella Organics. Um, those are all tested and, um, and, and, and um, comply with all regulations that the US EPA and Mass DEP set. And next slide. So this is a little bit Sorry, I apologize, a little blurry, but this is how anaerobic digestion works. So you got your food waste, put it in a pre-processing plant, kind of like what we just saw in the, the photo two, two photos ago. And then you're sent to the anaerobic digester. So there, they sit there and the microbes do their work. They generate methane, but it's in a sealed container. So the methane is held in this gas holder, for instance, and is stored, and then they use it to um, they, they consume it so that you can make electricity and heat. Um, this is a combined heat and power unit, which is a more efficient form of making electricity. So um, it's a very, very sustainable process. 
And then this is the digestate or what we call biosolids. And so those are stored and they can be used as a fertilizer product. Um, so, you know, taking a step back, you know, we've been looking at the horizon of what, what are other cities doing around food waste. And in the United States, we've learned that there's a, there's a number of major cities that are looking towards this new model of co-digesting your food waste at a wastewater treatment plant. So city of Oakland, Los Angeles, New York City, um, and some places up in upstate New York are just a few examples of cities that are doing this. And the reason they're doing it this way is that anaerobic digestion is beneficial because it requires less time and space than traditional composting. And um, you know, when you think about these cities, we're talking hundreds of tons a day are generated. And so it's, you would need a massive facility to manage that. Um, and the other piece to why these facilities are sprouting up is that pre-processing is critical to managing contamination. So sending food waste with contaminants to a farm-based composting can be very problematic and might get you kicked out of their facility for having too much contamination. So, um, and then what's happening in Massachusetts? So, you know, anaerobic digestion, it's new. Uh, in 2016, it was only 48,000 tons of food waste was going to anaerobic digestion, whereas compost was doing more than that at 80,000. But things have shifted quite rapidly in Massachusetts um, and, and for good reason. That means the state has, they set a goal of uh, reducing food waste and they've set uh, a policy that says if you generate a certain amount of food waste and that's one ton per week, you're required to send that to either anaerobic digestion, compost or another diversion that's not a landfill or incinerator. And so huge spike in the number of tons going to anaerobic digestion just because we've got a large amount of restaurants, universities, and all that that are diverting more. And so anaerobic digestion is now four times uh, more um, prevalent than composting for managing food waste as of 2019. So it's a big shift that's happening in Massachusetts. And part of that shift is the US EPA has created this really helpful food recovery hierarchy. Um, you know, at the top is source reduction. So you know, eat the food that you have, try not to send any to waste. You know, the next step below that is feed hungry people. Um, you know, a great example of that in Cambridge is food for free. Uh, right next to City Hall, they do a great job of helping get, get food to people that, you know, maybe uh, aren't able to afford it. Um, also another awesome organization, the Daily Table in Central Square uh, just opened a few months ago and they do a great job of, of trying to help get higher up on that food recovery hierarchy. So feeding animals would be after that. And then after that is um, industrial uses. So this is where anaerobic digestion falls. So um, it produces um, a, a biogas and a fertilizer product. And so this is why uh, it has two beneficial uses. That's why uh, the EPA is, is listed it just above composting because it has two byproducts as opposed to composting, which has one byproduct of a soil amendment. And then obviously disposal is the last option you want. So um, I just wanted to kick it off with that. So this is a little bit about the city's food waste program. Um, I wanna kick it over to Sissima and Ben Morelli. They did this amazing assessment, which is basically doing uh, a life cycle analysis on behalf of the city of Cambridge, because they look specifically at the Greater Lawrence Sanitary District and how it performs and why it's a great option for not just the city of Cambridge, but for Massachusetts as a whole. So I, uh, I don't want to speak too much more. I'll do some questions at the end. My email is up here at the top. If anyone has any other questions, I'm happy to chat about what we're doing with our food waste and, and why we're doing it that way. Um, but I'm going to kick it over uh, and stop sharing and allow Sissy Ma to take us to the next, the next step. So um, glad to be here. Um... I Cambridge, uh, this is amazing opportunity to share what we have been done. So I want to give a little bit of background why EPA is interested in this type of work. Like Mike said, um, actually, I, a lot of you probably follow the news um, recently. I mean, even today, uh, the climate summit. So the administration committed that U.S. is going to cut the emission, the global warming uh, emission to 50% by the end of this decade. So it's not too far away. And all the efforts that we can do to help that mission, I mean, in water systems, this is one of these efforts. Um, wastewater treatment has been ongoing doing 
the treatment technologies. And now, how can we uh, manage the, the biosolids, the, the sludge from wastewater and the food waste? Can we work together as a co-digestion? It doesn't make sense. So this work, what we've done is looking at the life cycle system, lab cycle assessment and the costing side to see if this practice actually doesn't make sense. I mean, it's not just recovering the carbon, on the climate change side, we also need to be conscious on the cost side and also on the <clears throat> on the 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 risk side. So um, this fortunately a couple of years ago, we actually um, work with the GLSD and get the data from their facility and comparing and to answer these exact questions. So it's great that Massachusetts have this um, food ban ordinance and encourage the diversion of the food waste from the landfill. And the question is, the research question is, um, what are you going to do with the food waste? Does it make sense to co-digest, to compost, or go some other ways? Uh, we need the data to show that. So the point is, it's not just address one um, issue. If it's just the environmental impact, you want to curtail the global warming emission, you also need to be conscious on the cost side. So the economic um, the economic scale coming come into play. Um, so this is the, the project that we set it up and to compare different food disposal options. One is co-digestion with the wastewater and the other one is the compost and landfill and waste to energy disposal. So with that, I can turn to, oh no, the next one is, so actually, yeah, we, we actually, before Lawrence, Massachusetts, we worked with um, um, Bath, New York, um, their wastewater facility. That was a smaller one, one million gallon per day. And Massachusetts, the Lawrence one is a little bit larger. It's 23 million gallon per day uh, facility. There's a lot of the wastewater treatment facility like this size. So we, we decided to also work on the medium sized wastewater facility and, and tackle the question, the environmental and the cost side of the impact. Um, is the co-digestion is a good one. And on the compo composting side, we choose the two different types of windrow and aerated static pile methods. And to compare this reuse, to uh, recover the carbon energy recovery, comparing to the landfill and waste to energy. And to validate that, you know, the, the food waste then is, is actually a good thing. But one thing keep in mind, uh, co-digestion versus compost, this is not an either or proposition. Um, your DEP estimated food waste um, from your wastewater, I mean, from your solid waste is actually more than a quarter of the waste stream. So that's quite a bit. Um, if there's a 350,000 tons per year, that's actually exceeding the combined capacity of the compost and digestions, digesters in the region. So um, we want to bring that out to keep that out in mind. It's not a one or the other option, but we want to give the science the, the science underneath that the practice, which one actually makes the sense. So with that, next I'll turn to Ben to talk about the whole um, life cycle assessment on the project. There we go. So the study that we performed was a life cycle assessment, and you ought to forgive me, my voice is a little bit messed up. I have, I'm feeling a little bit under the weather today. <clears throat> um, but we performed a life cycle assessment study and we look at the cradle to grave environmental impacts of providing a, a process or service. In this case, that service is, there we go, is uh, the provision of, of waste management for one kilogram of food waste. So when we dive into the results, all of them will be on that basis. Um, we assess a number of environmental impact categories as well as cost information. Um, in this presentation, we're going to focus on global warming potential and eutrophication potential. Uh, eutrophication is a water quality indicator um, associated with nutrient pollution in marine and freshwater environments. Uh, we also looked at a number of air quality indicators as well as water consumption and fossil fuel use. Um, one of the really important phases of a life cycle assessment is called the life cycle inventory phase. That's where we essentially come up with a list of materials, um, energy inputs into a particular process. 
um, as well as uh, emissions associated with that process. Um, for anaerobic co-digestion, we worked with GLSD, the facility that Cambridge is using currently. Um, so the data is largely based on their actual facility data, and we supplemented that with some um, model simulations from this program, GPSX, which is a wastewater treatment process modeling uh, software. Um, to develop inventory data for composting, we relied on peer-reviewed literature, um, so scientific studies. Um, and then for waste energy combustion and landfilling, we use a tool, another EPA tool called the Municipal Solid Waste Decision Support Tool, which is specifically intended to develop lifecycle inventory data for MSW options. Um, and that model was parameterized to be specific to food waste in the case of this project. Um, this diagram shows the flow, the process flow diagram for the wastewater treatment facility. A number of important things to note here. Um, you can see that we have, we show electricity infrastructure and different chemicals coming into the plant, uh, diesel fuel consumption. So all of these impacts associated with the consumption of these materials by the wastewater treatment facility are considered within the assessed environmental impacts. Um, for this particular part of the project, we're interested in isolating the environmental impacts associated with processing the food waste at the wastewater treatment facility. Um, so what that means is that we need to separate it from the impacts associated with the normal operations of the treatment plant associated with uh, wastewater treatment um, that's been historically occurring at the plant. So this presentation or this, uh, these boxes here kind of highlight the processes that are specifically affected by accepting food waste at, at GLSD. Um, <clears throat> As Michael was mentioning, the, the food waste is processed in, in Charlestown and is then trucked to GLSD as a, a bio slurry. Um, and it's introduced directly into the anaerobic digester where it boosts biogas production as well as increases the quantity of, of digestate or solids that are uh, exit the digester. Um, and then there are some feedbacks with the larger wastewater treatment facility. So, the solids that come out of the digester are put into a centrifuge and the liquid portion is separated from the solids. The liquids head back to the main biological processes at the wastewater treatment plant. And so our analysis assesses the increased greenhouse gas emissions associated with the, um, uh, the liquid or the pollutants in the liquid portion of the digestate. Um, so those impacts are included as well as the increased effluent discharges to the local watershed. Um, <clears throat> the fact that the food waste is accepted does increase chemical consumption at the facility to some extent, so those impacts are included. Um, and in terms of the solids, uh, they're sent to a pellet drying facility, which turns them into essentially a, a pelletized uh, fertilizer equivalent. And those are then trucked to agricultural fields in the region where they displace chemical fertilizer um, and the analysis also includes any emissions associated with uh, land application of, of those materials. Um, um, hey, Ben, real quick, I just want to hop in. We've got about 10 minutes for before Q&A, so I just want to okay. give that a up. Thank you. Um, this slide shows, uh, highlights the importance of, uh, or the effects of anaerobic co-digestion on energy production at the facility. So you can see there's two scenarios laid out here. This is the legacy facility. So prior to accepting food waste at the, at the wastewater treatment plant, um, they did already have digestion, but food waste wasn't being processed there. And, the, and uh, digestion at that time was able to satisfy about 80% of the heat demand at the facility. No electricity was produced historically. Um, once they began accepting food waste and installed combined heat and power, they began producing electricity. And now you can see that um, under the full capacity scenario, we have several scenarios that we considered in the study. Um, the facility is now uh, able to provide 100% of their electricity and heat demand um, based on the biogas that's produced from food waste co-digestion. Additionally, they produce about 6.1 or estimated to produce about 6.1 gigawatt hours of excess electricity annually. Um, and that is put out into the grid where it can displace uh, the normal New England grid mix, which has a lot of fossil fuels that are consumed in it. Um, in terms of composting, this just shows all of the processes that are included in the, in the model. Um, again, we consider two different composting methods, um, different air emissions associated with those two different methods, 
as well as energy consumption by those processes. The compost, similarly to the co-digestion scenario, is land applied, and we estimate carbon sequestration associated with that, the use of compost, as well as emissions to air and water. Um, this slide shows the, some of the items considered in the scenarios that we developed. Um, in terms of anaerobic digester performance, we consider the yield of biogas, uh, volatile solids reduction, which is essentially the efficient, an efficiency metric for an anaerobic digester, as well as the share of, of biogas that is ultimately flared and not sent to the CHP. So those things are all considered. Um, in terms of composting, we look at two scenarios, um, two scenarios for each of the methods, um, kind of a base or a, our best estimate of what the emissions uh, to nature are going to be, as well as an improved estimate. So this is a more optimistic scenario. And we also look at different transport distances. So to dive into some results here, um, we'll present two of these slides, one for global warming potential and one for eutrophication potential. Um, so to show the different op to describe the different options that are depicted on this slide, we have two scenarios for anaerobic digestion. There's the base performance. So this is our best guess of, of the global warming potential associated with anaerobic co-digestion of food waste. All the results are presented per kilogram of food waste. Um, so you can see kilogram of CO2 equivalents per kilogram of food waste. Um, the figure depicts net impacts. Um, which means we consider both impacts, uh, global warming potential impacts, as well as benefits. Um, <clears throat> any values below, falling below the x-axis here are benefit, and any values above the x-axis are an impact. Um, some, of the, some of the main thing, or I should also say, I guess, there's these four composting scenarios. It's the two base scenarios, there's the two improved scenarios, and then we have landfill and waste energy as well. Um, quickly to jump in. So if, uh, for folks that are reading this, the red dot gives uh -huh. you the net impact associated with each of these processes. So it basically yes. shows that AD is of the yes. lowest. So some of the major trends that we see. So in terms of, uh, the food waste management options that are producing a net benefit, um, we see both of the digester scenarios, the, the base and the low performance scenario, they have the best environmental performance in terms of global warming potential. Um, both of the improved composting scenarios yield a net benefit as well as waste to energy combustion. Um, one of the main takeaways is the fact that all of these management options, both digestion, co-digestion, or digestion, composting, and even waste to energy yield a considerable reduction in global warming potential relative to landfill disposal. Um, some of the major, the bar segments kind of depict the, the main concert contributions to global warming potential that we're seeing here. So in the case of landfilling, this white kind of hashed bar segment here is this is process emissions. So as, as Michael mentioned, uh, methane emissions from landfill are a, a big issue. And so that's mostly with where the impact is coming from in terms of the landfill. In terms of some of the benefits associated with digestion, we see very large significant credits associated with avoided electricity production. Um, that's the orange bar segment here, as well as avoided natural gas combustion. This is from the heat uh, recovered from the biogas process. Um, we do also see, uh, you know, some of on the impact side, there's still some process emissions associated with, with AD as well as with composting. Um, on-site combustion emissions is this purple bar segment, for example, as well as electricity consumption at the, at the plant itself. Um, so all of these different impacts are kind of considered within the estimate of net global warming potential. I'm gonna skip over this cumulative energy demand slide, but in terms of eutrophication potential, this is the main water quality indicator. Um, and it's a pretty important impact category for wastewater treatment facilities. And one thing to notice here is that you know, we see it kind of an opposite trend actually, where there's more eutrophication potential associated with anaerobic digestion. And most of this is associated with effluent release at the wastewater treatment facility. Um, and even more uh, associated with composting as well compared to the landfill and waste to energy. Um, one thing to note about this is that these are not necessary, these are just potential impacts. That's what, uh, that's what LCA assesses. Um, and there are definitely management practices that can be employed both at the wastewater treatment facility and at different composting facilities to kind of minimize or potentially even eliminate 
um, these eutrophication potential impacts. Um, this slide here shows, so this is ammonia emissions at the wastewater treatment facility and then total phosphorus emissions. Um, the red line, so the dates are across the bottom here. This is 2017 to 2018. Um, the red line indicates when the facility began accepting food waste. Um, and you kind of see these are uh, data or effluent quality data that the facility collected. Um, and you don't actually see a market increase in ammonia or phosphorus emissions actually after the facility begins accepting food waste. Um, they started accepting 20,000 gallons per day at this point in time. So um, definitely more information is available now. Um, but what this slide is telling, telling us is that, well, maybe we're actually overestimating this eutrophication potential uh, based on what the increases in effluent that the facility is actually seeing. Uh, but it's definitely important to consider. In terms of the summary results, um, this shows all of the different impact categories across the bottom here. These are uh, presented as a percentage of maximum impact. Um, so eutrophication potential, cumulative energy demand, global warming potential, et cetera. Um, the main takeaways here are, again, any values that are below the x-axis are these are environmental benefits. So we can see that um, this is eutrophication potential, again, highest for anaerobic digestion, but for CED, cumulative energy demand, global warming potential, acidification potential, fossil fuel depletion potential, smog formation, um, particulate matter formation, and also cost, depending on the scenario. Um, anaerobic digestion outperforms all of the other management options. Um, <clears throat> in terms of Water consumption, composting is the, has the uh, most positive environmental results. Um, so some of the key environmental conclusions are that, you know, co-digestion outperforms other disposal options in, in seven of the nine results categories that we considered in this analysis. Uh, when considering global warming potential, um, <clears throat> both digestion and composting considerably reduce uh, those impacts when compared to the landfill disposal. One of the main issues uh, for composting is that it sacrifices the opportunity to recover the energy potential available in food waste. And this reduces the potential environmental benefits associated with that, with that energy capture. Um, and another thing to note about both co-digestion and composting compared to landfill or waste to energy is that they, they both allow for additional nutrient cycling benefits compared to these disposal options where um, we're able to capture those nutrients um, and use them for beneficial agricultural purposes uh, you know, around Massachusetts. Um, this is a standard EPA disclaimer. They, they supported the development of this research, but it's not necessarily their official opinions. Um, and we do, of course, we're indebted to, to the people at the Lawrence Sanitary District for helping us collect this information, as well as um, uh, officials at MassDEP and the US EPA for describing the current state of food waste disposal in Massachusetts. Um, we have a lot of additional resources. We have kind of all available in the public domain that I want you to be aware of. We have an EPA report. This goes into a lot more detail about the results that we presented today. We also have a peer reviewed uh, journal publication in water science and technology. This is an open source uh, article, so anybody can download it for free. And then there's a two part article in the BioCycle magazine, um, which is a much, which is kind of the easiest read of the, of the three options and it pro will help to reinforce a lot of the conclusions uh, that we discussed today. And so those are all available online uh, for free. Great. We're happy. Yeah, thank you, Ben. Um, this is perfect, right on time. So uh, I know there was a lot of information thrown out there. Um, just to kind of give some summary, I know some of these, there might be some people that may not know some of these terminologies. So basically the, the whole of it was you know, looking at all these different environmental categories associated with disposing of waste, because at the end of the day, we have to figure out how are we going to manage this waste at the end of the day. So we got to look at all these different environmental attributes. And that's what the EPA and ERG looked at. Um, and they wanted to compare the four main options of food waste management. So landfill is a huge option. 
waste to energy, which is incineration, just basically burning the food waste along with other trash, um, which generates electricity, but has some you know, impacts. Composting and then co-digestion of food waste at an anaerobic digester at a wastewater treatment plant, which is a mouthful, but is basically what Cambridge is doing. So um, they looked at all those. And what's really interesting is, you know, the trend of anaerobic digestion is just kind of starting out. Um, Oakland, I think, was one of the first uh, wastewater treatment plants to start taking food waste. And that was only in the last seven years or so, I believe. Um, so it's, it's a relatively new technology to put food waste with wastewater treatment plants. Um, but it's really exciting and it's, it's a great opportunity for urban communities, but it may not be applicable across the nation. So I think this kind of research was really helpful to help understand why we need to get food out of the trash first and foremost and either into composting or anaerobic digestion. Yeah, I just wanna add, um, when we try to do these kind of practice, um, it's uh, keep in mind, we are dealing with multiple um, attributes. So we, we don't wanna just um, address the climate change issue, but compromise the water quality or compromise the health the risk side. So the tool like uh, life cycle assessment give us that um, opportunity to value all these at the same time. Um, the, uh, I, I believe we might have, uh, I have to double check, but we do have a monthly newsletter that we send out on behalf of the city of Cambridge, where we share information like this. So this study came out, um, I believe summer of 2019, or I could be wrong, but um, it's a relatively new um, study. And I think we'll try to make sure it's in our upcoming newsletter if it isn't already. And if you'd like to get on our newsletter. We do have a question. Okay, Councillor Nolan, go ahead. Oh, is it okay? Sorry, I didn't. <laughs> no, no problem. Go for it. So my question is about the, um, the study, which is wonderful. I really appreciate you all taking this on. In the um, discussion of the outputs from the various methods, is the product coming out of the anaerobic digestion, which I would assume is mixed in with some sewage sludge and some other non-food waste, is that product which if it is true, if that assumption is true, that it is mixed with non-food waste products. So it could be mixed in with stuff coming from a variety of sources from around cities. It would then include the possibility of heavy metals and contaminations that would not be in strict food waste. So the question is whether the products that come out of it, that whether they're pelletized or not, many of them in the past have been tested and have not actually met food safety standards for direct application to crops. Um, so is this something that was um, found in this study or that was looked at to understand the differences between the kind of soil that would have come out of either of the two kinds of uh, compost operations compared to the products that would have come out of an anaerobic digester? If that makes sense as a question to those who did the study. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that uh, really quick. Um, for the municipal wastewater, we usually, um, consider there's a pre-treatment program in place for industrial wastewater. So usually these wastes, uh, wastewater, waste should not get into the wastewater stream, the municipal wastewater stream. And um, I believe in Ms., um, Lawrence, Massachusetts, the GLSD, their waste product. They, they, yeah, they have pre-industrial treatment requirements for right. certain and facilities, yeah. They have to monitor their waste, right? To, submitted to the reg regulator. So we did not consider that in our, in our analysis. Yeah, so you know, one other um, tidbit to add onto that is the, the biosolids that end up at the end, what you would do with those biosolids conventionally in the past, you'd either incinerate them or landfill them. And so those biosolids have a lot of nutrients. And if we, you know, most of what the biosolids is made up of is basically peep and poo or pee, sorry, pee and poo. So it's what we flush down the toilet and down the sinks. And if we were to continue to take all those biosolids and just landfill and incinerate them consistently, we're gonna have to find a new fertilizer um, resource. And if you wanna you know, produce synthetic fertilizers that has different climate change emission associated with that. So it's, um, it's not about necessarily, it's a, it's a, it's, you gotta look at like the different risks associated with that. So if we were to take those biosolids for instance, and landfill them, 
Well, the people that buy those biosolids, now they're going to go buy synthetic fertilizers made from natural gas. And so when you look at the whole life cycle piece of it, the EPA has said that, um, you know, they're rated based on different classifications, class A biosolids, class B biosolids, and class A can be land applied, but not necessarily for food all the time, but for, you know, the center of highway medians or golf courses or places where you're not necessarily growing food. And so then you're able to offset the consumption of synthetic fertilizer. I mean, I think the other thing to note is, you know, the biosol or the resulting digestate, uh, you know, which is a combination of food waste and, and sewage sludge, uh, you know, is tested very, is tested regularly and address it, you know, for a number of parameters that address both environmental and human health risks um, and is, you know, essentially certified for uh, application in, in farm and home gardening applications. So, you know, biosolids and their safety in terms of land application have been considered for decades at this point. Um, and that's something that Mass DEP and EPA is aware of and has been, you know, has developed programs to address. So. There's no other questions. I think at the end of the day, I think one of the biggest uh, takeaways for this is we've got a massive climate change issue. You know, we've got energy efficiency we need to do. We've got converting. We have a lot of things we need to do. And nothing is going to be a silver bullet. Um, anaerobic digestion, obviously, it has some, it has some drawbacks. Every, but, you know, landfill incineration have major drawbacks. So the goal of this is not necessarily to say we have to go to the wastewater treatment plant. The goal of this is we have to get it out of the landfill and incinerators. And if we, if we keep arguing whether compost is better or anaerobic digestion is better, we're losing. Everyone loses if we have that discussion. The goal of this is get it out of the landfill and incinerator. Let's start making clean energy or let's start making a soil amendment. Great. Thank you so much, Mike, Sissy, and Ben. This was great. We so appreciate you taking the time with us and, and you were so on time too. This was perfectly, perfectly scheduled. Thank you all so much. We really appreciate that. I've gotten text messages from colleagues who have said this is a really interesting chat. So thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you, Jim. And now I'm going to turn it over to our another one of our wonderful youth teams. This one is led by Edie Filson, and we've got um, a bunch of other folks with her as well. We have Ifra, Feda, Iman, and Aya who are joining us today, and they're going to give you an amazing presentation. It is really, really good. I use that word a lot, but um, I truly believe it. Um, on bike education and what they have actually, um, it's a presentation that they have given to second graders in the in the school district. So uh, it's a really exciting one. Thank you all. We're really excited to be here today. Um, this team has been working really hard on making this presentation um, and specifically for second graders because usually we run the Safe Routes to School uh, pedestrian and bike program for all second graders. And with COVID this year, uh, we've been looking for different ways to um, still deliver the bike education portion of it. So uh, this team of interns put together this really cool presentation. Um, and I think it means a lot coming from uh, the older students. So I will let them take over and introduce the presentation and, and themselves. Okay. Hello everyone, welcome to our bike webinar. We're excited to have you. We're a group of Sierra Lake students and we've spent the past few months making this presentation to teach you guys about bike safety. So before riding, you know the rules and how to have fun biking while staying safe. Have you guys ridden a bike before? The topics we will be covering today are helmet fit, ABC quick check, being visible, hand signals, urban cycling tips, and sidewalk safety. Before we introduce ourselves, my name is Ifra. My favorite color is aqua and I love playing basketball after school. Hi, my name is Iman. My favorite color is red and I like to run after school. I'm Aya. My favorite color is pink and I like going to clubs after school. My name is Fada. My favorite color is blue and I like walking my dog after school. What's a bike and why do you guys like to ride bikes? Well, yes, bikes are vehicles. Did you know bicycles are considered vehicles by law, just like cars and trucks? It's just cars and trucks are motor vehicles. Bikes have two wheels, but can you think of a vehicle with one wheel? 
How about a unicycle? There are different types of bikes like mountain bikes and road bikes and trick bikes like BMX bikes. Bikes can go fast or slow. Bikes can go places that cars can't take you. Bikes are a way you can also have a workout and they also help the environment because you're not using gas. Also, you don't have to be a certain age to ride a bike because you don't need a bike license. Anyone can ride a bike. Our first topic is, drumroll please, helmet fit. The picture shows wrong ways to put on a helmet. The right one is over here, the bottom right. Do you guys think the others are right? No, because the helmet needs to fit your head, it shouldn't be on your face, and it shouldn't cover your eyes. Did you guys know that helmets are designed to break? If you crash and hit your head, your helmet is designed to break so your head won't. So if you do crash, throw it away because it could have tiny cracks that you can't see. You should always be wearing a helmet before getting on your bike and make sure you are doing it in a way that protects your head. Here is something you should do when putting on your helmet to make sure it fits properly. It's called the eyes, ears, and mouth check. First is the eye check. You may be wondering why we need to check our eyes. It is very important because it makes sure that the helmet is covering your forehead. What's behind your forehead? Your brain, the pointy side of the helmet should be in the front and two fingers above your eyebrows, as shown in the picture over here. Next is the ears check. This part makes sure that your helmet is centered and you feel comfortable. You have to make sure the straps of the helmet forms a V about an inch under your ears. Lastly, we have to go over the mouth check. This part is important because you have to make sure your helmet is on your head tightly and not able to fall off. You can open your mouth as wide as you can to see if it is tight enough. You should not be able to pull the strap over your chin. Make sure you do the eyes, ears, mouth check every time you put on your helmet and ride your bike. Now we have another check. This time it's for your bike. What do you guys think the ABC Quick Check stands for? What are things you would want to check on your bicycle before riding on such with A, B, and C? Can you guess what ABC, ABC Quick Check stands for? So A stands for air, B stands for brakes, and C stands for chain. For air, you want to check your tires by pinching the tire to check the pressure. For brakes, lift one tire up at a time and spin it. Squeeze the levers to see if the tire stops. And for chain, you want to check by checking your chain to make sure it's not rusty and that it's in good condition. Next up, we have a cartoon that Feta made. Oh, hi guys. Today we will talk about helmets. A fun fact about helmets is if you know how to ride your bike, you won't have to wear a helmet. Crazy, right? Um, actually, that's not true. You need to always be wearing a helmet when you're riding your bike. It protects your head and your brain. Oh, now I understand. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Just make sure you're telling your students correct information. Don't just give them wrong information that you don't know. Okay, I got it. Okay, sorry about that, guys, but another crazy fact to know is the ABC Quick Check. A stands for air, B stands for bike, and C stands for crankset. It's really important to know. Okay, bye, guys. See you next class. Wait a minute, guys. In the ABC Quick Check, A stands for air, B stands for brakes, and C stands for chain. Make sure you remember that because that's very important. Oh, now I understand. I'm going to write this down so I can remember next time. Can you show it to the class what you have learned, please? Yeah, sure. So today I learned that you need to wear your helmets every time you ride your bike because it protects your head and your brain. And lastly, I learned that A stands for air and then B stands for brakes and lastly C stands for a chain. Well, great job. Here's an A+. I learned two new things today. Thank you so much. Our third topic is, drumroll please, being visible. When biking, especially at night, we need to be visible to bike safely. This will help drivers and other people on the street notice you while you're riding your bike. When riding your bike, you should wear a bright or reflective clothing, any type of clothing that is bright, because it will help people 
especially drivers, notice you. Our fourth, our fourth topic is hand signals. Hand signals are very important because that's how other vehicles and other cyclists see when and where you're going to turn. For turning left, extend the left arm straight out. You can also point the fingers of your left hand to the left if that's what comes naturally to you. For right turns, extend your left arm out with your elbow bent and point your hands to sky with your palm facing forward like you're making an L with your arm. You can also swing a right turn with your arm, with your arm right arm, with your right arm straight out. However, it will save your body's traffic on when you're riding, your left side. So it's better to use the L-shaped right turn signal than your right arm. For stopping, you send your left arm out, down at a right angle with your palm facing behind you. Our fifth topic is bike lanes. Bike lanes, there are different. There's, there are lots of different bike lanes, but bike lanes are only for bikers. One type of bike lanes is separated bike lanes. Separated bike lanes are street level and use a variety of methods for physical protection from passing traffic. Another type of bike lanes are two-way separated bike lanes. Two-way separated bike lanes are physically separated bike lanes that allow bicycle movement in both directions on one side of the road. Here are also some bike lanes in Cambridge. Our next topic is urban cycling tips. When driving, always beware of turning vehicles, look for motors, and whenever possible, stay away um, from turning vehicles. Okay. And when biking, always beware of the door zone. It is this lane marked in red, and it's usually where drivers will open their car door. So if you get too close, you can crash and flip over. And so that way, the best area to um, bike is the yellow zone right here. When biking, always go in a straight line, even if there is an empty parking spot and you think it might be easier to leave in. Leaving in is very dangerous because it'll surprise the driver next to you. As cyclists, we always want to be predictable. Our last topic is, drum roll please, rules of the road. Bikers and drivers have the same rules. 16 and younger must wear a helmet. No headphones while riding, hands on your bike and eyes on the road, don't ride while texting and stop at red lights. You can ride your bike on a sidewalk, but only outside of business districts. Be aware of cars pulling out of driveways. Watch out, par watch out for parked cars opening their doors. To start a bike, be on a power pedal position and slow down when you see a car taking a right turn or right hook. And that's it. Thank you guys so much for watching. Oh, that was so good, you all. That was that was so much better than even just two weeks ago. Good job. Oh, you've got a question. What is the power pedal position? Who from the team can can explain what that is? Adi, do you want to explain it? Sure. So the power pedal position is a position um, at about let's see. Uh, three o'clock. If you were to think of your your uh, rightmost pedal um, as a clock, and um, right about at three o'clock, where it's parallel with the with a tube next to it, the of your bike frame, and if you put your pedal in that position from and um, push down on it to launch yourself off, it gives you. It's a position that gives you the most power in starting. Um, so it gives you that beginning momentum. Um, to help you balance. Great, thank you for that, Adi. You all did such a great job. Thank you for being here. I know it's right after school time, so we very much appreciate it. Uh, and we're going to say goodbye to this team who have been working so hard for the past nine months now um, to, to learn all about this stuff and, and learn how to teach about it. So thank you all very much. And then we'll get to see Adi back in just a little bit and she's gonna teach us about bike physics. So that'll be really fun. Um, so thank you all, we'll see you soon. And now we have another youth group um, coming on and we're going to get to test out for anybody who's been here all day. Um, you heard us talk about the video game that the faucet failures created over the past nine months. And now you're going to get to, to try out the video game with them, which is really, really exciting. For folks who are just joining us, thank you and welcome to Science in the City. We're very happy to have you.
Perfect. Thanks so much, Jed. We're super excited. This is our first kind of uh, mass beta test. So I'll let uh, Orlando and Labib kind of talk us through here. But I, So uh, I won't do too much more talking. Orlando, uh, if you want to uh, share the screen of the game through your computer, that would be great. And you can kind of talk us through it and Labib can help us along and we can get going. Okay, I guess just as an introduction as we all open up the game. Um, we sort of started this game uh, to teach about some sort of uh, simple ways you can deal with water conservation and like, healthy water habits while uh, as well teaching about the, the new uh, floating wetland that we just recently placed into the Charles River just I think half a year ago. So if everyone has the game open, I'll, I'll try to figure out how to share my screen right now. And then Orlando, as you're talk, uh, just before you start playing, will you just explain to folks what, before you even came to this, like how did you even decide to come up with this game idea? And then I put also in the chat for folks, the Charles River Conservancy is the organization we've been working with. And thank you for being here. We can see that you're here as attendees. Um, and we've been modeling the game off of the floating wetland. So I can kind of explain how we got to this game idea. Um, when... Like during the global challenge, we uh, we were searching for target audiences, and like we really wanted to um, have a message about the water crisis that appeals to the younger audience. And with a game, um, like I know in my like my elementary school experience, they had like all these computer games like on fast math and stuff like that. That would kind of like breed like uh, it would create like a competitive nature in the classroom and like everyone would be everyone would be excited to play the game so that's what we try to do with this uh foster failures game um we took uh too many games and we have that to kind of ask questions for the kids and um just for them to have fun and then we have the main game which is the, the my wetlands part portion that really focuses on the science of the wetland in the charles river yeah, so I guess the game, the overall game sort of revolves around the relationship between our two mini games, uh, Pipe Palooza and Buckets. And what you'll do in those in those games, you'll, they're sort of, yeah, they're, they're fun mini games, but the thing is there, you combine them. Here, I can show you. Whenever you start, after being prompted, prompted like uh, which difficulty you want to play, you'll be met with these uh, trivia questions that are about sort of water uh, conservation and more general water effects. And so take this question, you must answer, okay, uh, what percent of the world's water is drinkable? And I guess we, we sort of made the, all the, all these like trivia questions. So we do know the answers for the most part. So it's that one here. Okay, and then after you've answered three questions correctly, you can move on to the actual mini game, which are actually pretty difficult. Here, you're just trying to uh, connect all. <laughs> oh my God, I'm struggling right now. And you can see in the background, we have- I'm gonna the lose the water yeah. rising and that's like you have to try to connect the pipes before it gets to the top and so the whole reason we have these mini games is so you can con um, collect droplet points if you see in the corner um orlando right now has 15 droplet points and that's going to come into play um in the my wetland game and it's also maybe it's kind of fun to like have kids like compare like how many other points they have it's like um something they can rank their progress by yeah so through these mini games um the kids will like have fun playing the games and sort of sort of increase their general knowledge about water and water conservation and then i guess we'll move on to the other mini game before we move on to uh our wetland game and i probably should have practiced before doing this presentation because the games are kind of hard too um this answer is cyanobacteria. Oh, that was incorrect. And then if you if you answer the, the question incorrect, it will obviously give you the correct answer so the kids can learn. 
Okay, then I guess we have some easier questions again. And then this game, uh, even more simple, you just try to collect water and it sort of encourages saving water and yeah. If you choose the harder difficulties, we have more like chaotic conditions and um, you'll have some objects that you have to like avoid. Um, but here is just try to capture as much water as you can. And then, so you'll gain these water drop of points from completing these games and completing the trivia. And what you can do with these water drop of points is come over to our sort of uh, wetland game, where this is sort of the most um, uh, undeveloped, underdeveloped game we have. We, ha we haven't finished all the art and all the sort of game concepts, but here, basically yeah. this is based off the real life wetland we have in the Charles River over near um, over near MIT in East Cambridge. It basically is uh, constantly 24 seven in the Charles River sort of supplying habitat for zooplankton, which sort of been, the habitat has sort of been like rotted away because of the building of infrastructure along this, the banks of the river. And this is just sort of teaching generally about that. Yeah, this portion is kind of the, what we're working on right now. It's. We're working on a lot of arts to make this more aesthetically pleasing. Um, like the background can use some work and we want, um, you can see the three types of zooplankton, um, uh, uh, the cyanobacteria, sorry. At the bottom we have Annie, Fanny, and Mike. They're all um, in the blue, green, and red. Uh, we want them to have different paths. Right now they're kind of all just jumbled in the bottom. But basically, um, in this wetland portion of the game, we have three kind of types of cyanobacteria that you have to be. We have the big ones, the medium, and like the a lot of the tiny ones. So you have three tiers to beat. And basically, with your droplet points, um, you'll try to go to the shop, buy some flowers, and these flowers will kind of like harvest zooplank. Um, uh, will harvest like. Uh, more zoom plankton to kind of take these side and bacteria away and you can check your progress with the turbidity meter um, that's just how you know like how many um, kind of side and bacteria you have left to take out um, so right now like since there are no plants we still have all the tier one side bacteria and the tier twos and the tier threes so once you beat all the tier threes that's when you win the, that's when you beat the game yeah, so obviously there's a bunch of placeholders here. And like, if I open up like the, the big book of plants that we have, we just have like flower one, flower two, flower three, but we'll sort of fill in what the actual plants in the actual wetland will be here eventually as we sort of create more art and sort of research more about the, the specific plants. And then, yeah, so this game is supposed to be like the, the sort of long time commitment that kids will put in and then to learning about more about the Charles River and the plants that, uh, and the processes that happen in the river. So this is also kind of where we want them to kind of like personalize their wetland, kind of like mix and match, um, make theirs personal and have them try and beat like maybe like the, the top time to take out all the tier two, tier three cyanobacteria. So this is where they'll have the most customization options. Yeah. All right, and you all have a question also in the chat. So um, Carol has written, I love the graphics. What do you hope players will take away from the game? And have you thought about sharing the game with teachers who might also be able, oh, oh I went all the way to the top, hold on. Who might also be able to, who might also be talking about water cycle or other such topics? I think you have answers to both of those. So the first one is, what do you hope they get away with it? And have you thought about talking to teachers? Okay, so for what we hope um, kids get away with it is to become more water conscious. So uh, we didn't run through all the trivia questions, but a lot of them are about like how long you should take showers for, what, what the 
the preferred way of like washing dishes is. And through these sort of small questions and trivia, you, you'll slowly see like children who play the game will become better at, uh, and develop good habits when it comes to water conservation. And then also for our wetland game is to teach about this, this sort of uh, the water crisis in Cambridge. And uh, we definitely plan to share these to the teachers. Um, we think that like the teachers can in incorporate um, this game into lessons and have them learn about like water, um, the water crisis like over time. Um, I know in elementary school, there is a field trip that many kids go on to the Fresh Pond Water Treatment Plant. Um, so we were thinking that this game could be used as a tool to kind of um, further like advance their learning that they do during the field trip. And yeah, it's, it's perfect time because uh, Ranger Tim just jumped on and he's doing the next session. So we'll learn about the water department. <laughs> I do. Uh, and so we are um, also just today, Simon sent the link over to this, the science coordinator for the city, uh, for the school district. And the sixth grade teachers are going to be testing this out with their classrooms next week and the week after. Um, though it's, the goal was a little bit younger. Sixth grade is what we could get for the school district in their schedule this year. So they're going to test it out. And there's a, a survey that they'll fill out, which will also put into the chat for you all. Um, feel free to play the game, fill out the survey later. And the, the survey is really to figure out like, does it make sense? Do you understand what, what the goal is? Do you understand um, how to get to the next level? All of those kinds of things that the students have been working on with the game developer, but they're so in it because they've been building it for so long that they need some help from other folks to give them some feedback. Um, all right, so you've got five more minutes. Do we have any other questions? Do we want to play the game? How do you want to do with your next five minutes? Um, I think there was a uh, part about, oh, in part of the question from earlier, that's asked about the water cycle. And I think we definitely have a bunch of ideas about other sort of water, water conservation topics we got to, we want to add into the game. But as you can see, the stuff we have now is a little, not quite 100% completed. So we're sort of working on like fine tuning and finishing all the stuff we have now before we add things, but we definitely want to add more. We definitely have ideas. So. Yeah, and somebody put a, a note in the chat about the graphics being awesome and the graphics were all made by the team. So they did all the graphics. They did the, the only thing that the developer did was help them with a little bit of the, this is how games typically go to the next level. So they help them with that. And then they coded the graphics to move. Yeah, so I guess if this, um, we could wrap it up. And if I, I'm, I'm guessing you guys are either playing right now or just looking at the, some of the graphics, but if there's any yeah. more questions, feel free to Thank ask. You, Orlando. So if there are other questions, yeah, just like Orlando said, go ahead and put them right in there. Um, and these are two of the four members of the team too. The other two are doing school stuff right now. So these two are the ones that are here today. Um, so we have another question. What was the hardest part of the process for you? Hmm. I think um, like a, por a part of the game that we worked like really hard on is uh, replayability. We had like all these ideas, but you kind of have to link them together to make something that you would want to go back to again and like play again and again. Um, that and uh, like screen flow, how it took a lot of planning to know like how, um, like what button should um, link us to this page, to this page, to this um, information. So I think all that took a lot of planning and we just, um, to make that go well with the art style, um, I think that was just the most difficult part. I think for me, it was sort of choosing what we wanted to focus on in the game. Because there's so many like angles and so many different topics you want to cover when addressing the issue, like a broad issue like the water crisis, that like combining like having fun and learning information is sort of hard. So we ended, I think we ended up choosing the, the right decision by going with sort of these mini games and then sort of uh, a platforming building game, like our wetland game. Yeah, that's great. And we're, we're just, we're really pumped. Also, so that you know, the, this team was um, one of two of the ultimate winners of, of the Glocal Challenge. So they won the whole shebang, which is really great. Okay, well, thank you guys. Hope you learned a bunch.
Bye, Thank folks. You. There's one last question. The name of the challenge is the Global Challenge. It's the EF Global Challenge. It's a partnership between EF Education First, the City of Cambridge, and the Cambridge Public Schools. And we do a design challenge every year. These students won by looking at how can we impact the global water crisis here in Cambridge. And I'm going to go really quickly. We're going to do a quick little video to transition us over to Ranger Tim. Uh, thank you all so much for being here. For folks who are just joining us, thank you for coming to Science in the City. We have had a full day of amazing videos and presentations and panel discussions about science in Cambridge and how we use that science to do our work. If stormwater pollution was rubber duckies, it wouldn't matter what went down storm drains. But it does. Because stormwater pollution is not rubber duckies. It's trash, oil, cigarette butts, and pet waste flowing untreated to the sea. That's not good for any of us because we all live downstream. Clean water. It means quality of life. Think blue, Massachusetts. All right, so that was courtesy of our Department of Public Works Stormwater Management Program. And with that, I'll turn it over to Ranger Tim, and we've got lots of awesome information. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Tim. Excellent, thank you, Jen, for that wonderful introduction. So um, briefly about myself, I am Ranger Tim. I'm a city ranger for the city of Cambridge, and I work primarily at Fresh Pond Reservation for the Cambridge Water Department because uh, Cambridge's largest open green spaces and most natural areas are for the express protection of our water resource areas. So um, we don't protect the area because we have rich wildlife species. We have rich wildlife species because we protect the area. And with that, I'd be happy, um, you know, I've studied wildlife biology. I am for the city of Cambridge. I'm also, I have the powers of an animal control officer uh, on public lands, which is the difference between the rangers and uh, the animal commission, which go onto private property. But, you know, there's uh, so many exciting animals and uh, things happening around Cambridge. If anyone would like to start it off, um, otherwise, if we don't have any questions pop up at first, I can inform you about some of our most recent arrivals. All right, well, <clears throat> until something rolls in, uh, the number one thing I've been receiving questions about over the past two months have been our great horned owls. This is uh, right there over my shoulder. Great horned owls are the most common species of owls here in Massachusetts. And they're also the largest non-migratory version we have. Uh, largest of Massachusetts being the snowy owl. But we have a dominant pair of great horned owls that live here at Fresh Pond Reservation in Cambridge and they draw a crowd. Uh, they laid their eggs this year on January 25th and the first of their eggs hatched February 28th. So that means we're just about uh, at almost at the two month mark for these baby owls, which we have one at this point. Uh, we did have more baby owls earlier, but that's uh, nature takes its course. There's a lot of sibling rivalry involved. Uh, it's like a little thunderdome up there. And uh, you know, the loser gets fed to the winner of the baby owl fights by the mother. Okay, so we saw a question here about migratory birds. Um, namely, have I seen a difference in first arrivals over time? Are there spe different species stopping here? Um, for example, Orioles. Um, that's a great question and I don't keep specific data on arrival times, but um, anecdotally it does change each year. Uh, we've seen the tree swallows come back this year at the same rate they have in the past. But other things, certain waterfowl, we're seeing a declining rate of uh, canvas backs that regu regularly come to Fresh Pond. Uh, we're seeing fewer come up on the spring migration route. Um, Orioles, you know, I've yet to have seen one this year. Our red-winged blackbirds and uh, the other migrants, we've seen the, the rest of the grackles and robins arrive. 
and the, the red winged blackbirds are doing well. Um, so it does fluctuate. Some years, one species will lag behind. Um, and sometimes it's unpredictable almost because uh, we're really dependent on other weather events up and down the coast because we're on the Atlantic Flyway and Fresh Pond is sort of the perfect calm resting point. If you don't want to be on the Boston Harbor or the Charles River, Fresh Pond is a great way to recharge your batteries. Um, so there are fluctuations over time, but the short answer is uh, I'm not sure exactly where the cause of that is, since it could even be a ripple effect from a pattern change in New Jersey. Oh, that's Good. really interesting. I hadn't thought about that kind of stuff before. What about, I, I saw you once at the pond uh, a, a little bit ago, and you were mentioning that there's a lot of people there now. Has that impacted the fact that so many more people are searching for places to go outside right now due to COVID? Uh, has that impacted the wildlife around the, around the pond? So that's another great question. Um, there's one of those correlation causation moments here where over the last summer, when we saw our highest summer visitation of all time, due to no museums, bars, bowling alleys, and other park spaces were closing their gates, um, we saw not only a high amount of visitation, but some of the highest uh, reports of wildlife being seen. And that's something that it wasn't a change in the wildlife because according to my observations, it was you know, uh, status quo. But the difference was people were stopping and looking, uh, sitting on a bench, gazing into the water, seeing these little changes and noticing. Uh, in the past, I've seen white-tailed deer 20 feet off the path, uh, standing still like a statue, and 25 people will walk by without turning their heads into the woods or the great horned owls. Uh, people ask, are the owls back this year? And the answer is, they never leave, they live here. And uh, then they ask, why don't I see them? And I ask, well, how many trees do you look up on your walk? Because they're up a tree, you just need to stop and look up. So people have been seeing a lot more wildlife and that is due to people being able to see the wildlife. Um, but the levels I've seen are, for the most part, unchanged. Wildlife understands and sort of knows their home range well. And they're finding ways to avoid people while still having the resource, which mainly is <clears throat> we have protected areas for our water resource. So the shoreline of Fresh Pond itself, certain um, filtration areas, artificial wetlands and meadows that are protected, that's where the animals will go. Uh, sometimes we'll see uh, injured wildlife purposefully go toward the reservoir uh, so that they can heal without being approached by dogs or people. And uh, another animal that has been seeing a lot more in this one, not only um, are the increased sightings just from people, we are seeing an increase in muskrat. So this is a muskrat skull. It is a uh, close, you know, not a very close relative of the beaver, but an aquatic, semi-aquatic rodent. And uh, if you can see those teeth, it's a lot smaller. They don't quite cut down trees. On the shorelines of Fresh Pond, they'll be eating reeds and lily pads. And uh, they seem to be quite the focus because they're furry and they swim. And people aren't used to quite seeing that. The only things they can think of are beavers and otters. And the truth is we have the two smaller uh, distant cousins of the beaver and the otter. We have the muskrat and the mink, which people have been seeing uh, chiefly because now they'll stop and gaze at the water, take a picture of the sunset instead of try to get their two and a half miles in before they go home for dinner. That's a really interesting point. Uh, so for folks who have been just started joining us, go ahead and put your questions right in the chat and we'll ask them out for you. Um, we do have a question about city lights. Do you have thoughts on city lights and their impact on migratory birds? And then the second question is, should we be implementing light ordinances to support the wildlife if there is an impact? 
You know, that is a great question. Currently, Fresh Pond Reservation does have ordinances for the water, uh, the Cambridge Water Board and the Fresh Pond Master Plan Advisory Board ordinances against lighting uh, in the evening because of the nature of a wild space that it is. And uh, through the Water Board and Advisory Board, they've known for years that the more native and natural our ecosystem, the more effective the reservation is as a living filter for pollution, like to keep those rubber duckies out because we're uh, right there by the Fresh Pond Mall and gas stations. So we work hard to divert any runoff away from our wetland resources. Uh, the city light, the lights do impact wildlife. As a matter of fact, um, the Cambridge, the Watertown Cambridge Greenway, a new uh, multi-use bike path which will be connecting in the grand scheme, the Minuteman network over at Alewife Station to the Charles River bike network over by um, the Arsenal Mall in Watertown does run through about a um, you know, third of a mile stretch through Fresh Pond Reservation. And that will not be lit. And that actually goes directly down the center of our nesting great horned owls mating territory. Now, had there been, or if there were to be installed lights on that path specifically at night, uh, that would directly impact our nocturnal predators, such as the great horned owl. Um, also, it affects our nocturnal wildlife corridors. Uh, once the sun sets, it's, some, it's a whole different world. Uh, the raccoons that are quivering, hiding up a tree uh, staying away from people and dogs all day, climb down and they are our cleaning service. Uh, we do have two coyotes over on the Fresh Pond golf course. They wait until the sun sets, the golfers leave, and then they're out. Uh, the lights would be a negative impact. Um, there's also impact on migratory birds as it um, you know, does add disturbance for diurnal animals that are used to darkness at night. Uh, so it's less restful there. And recently there was a wonderful image NASA shot of Cambridge at night. And it sort of flickered back and forth between um, day and night. And in Cambridge, there were two big dark spots. And uh, that was Fresh Pond Reservation and Mount Auburn Cemetery right on the Watertown line. And both of those areas are famous for their wildlife diversity. That's where you can see great horned owls and mink and red fox uh, regularly and in their own wild you know, native habitat, uh, not sort of a, a toughened up street version like the turkeys. And uh, that is because the environments are kept so natural. So implementing light ordinances uh, would be a positive thing um, of course, if it's a paved street, lights on it or off it won't make the difference, but light splashing into areas such as um, low-lying bushes uh, where animals can hide, uh, light shining up into trees does make it less desirable as a habitat for our wildlife. So if we can do whatever we can to make things more desirable, um, keeping light cycles as they're supposed to be, their uh, circadian rhythms are preserved, which um, if you disrupt a circadian rhythm, that's your daytime, nighttime cycles, uh, it adds stress and stress can kill wildlife uh, or change their behavior in a dangerous way. Great, Any thank other? you. And there's a question that is a great horned owl behind you, right? Yes, that is, um, and that is a, uh, uh, Roger Tory Peterson print. So uh, the Peterson's Guide to the Birds from the 70s. That's the page from the great, from the owl page, the great horned owl. That's great, thank you. I wanna go back to something you said a little bit ago about the coyotes, cause I've been he hearing a lot more um, sightings of them too. And I'm wondering, is it because we're just looking now or is it because there are actually more of them? So they follow very, um, uh, not so much strict, but they, they follow yearly cycles where their behavior changes and the time of day they'll be out, 
and their activity levels do change. Right now, we are right into their mating slash pupping season. So uh, mating is we're on the tail end of that, but now we're just getting into May, which is their pupping season, which is when they have their litters. So because of this, um, the, over the last month or so, with the pregnant female coyotes, they've need, needed to eat a lot more. So people have been seeing coyotes uh, out hunting more often because they are a family unit. So both the male and female will increase their hunt and um, they will share with each other. So that's what's happening here. We'll see a little bit less of them as they want to be more hidden. Um, as the pups come, they'll stay as much under wraps as they can. Um, and in that case, they can be aggressive if you come across the den. Uh, they won't go too far from the den, but um, if you are at Fresh Pond, the den is usually far into the woods, not seen from the trail, and uh, hard to get to. But sometimes a pet dog might uh, run that way, and then you might see them run back immediately. That's uh, because they got growled at by the mother coyote. And um, most human coyote interactions actually happen around November, around daylight savings. Uh, especially here in Cambridge in park spaces, people are used to going out on their walks. And you know, if you're used to going there to Fresh Pond after work, all of a sudden daylight savings hits, it is pitch black by 445. And the coyotes come out because they know they just come out at sunset, regardless of what your watch says. So people often get surprised seeing coyotes at 5 p.m. Uh, because those are the light cycles they're following and our human activity has changed in their eyes. Oh, I never thought of that. That's fascinating. Is there anything else you want to make sure that we know about the wildlife around Fresh Pond or what we should be doing as, as participants and residents of Cambridge to protect our wildlife? That's a great question. And really just realizing that wildlife is wild and that we are also animals, but we have domesticated ourselves. So people sometimes will ask like, oh, you know, these, these geese are walking right across the trail or, oh, that swan is being aggressive. Ooh, I got too close to this tree and the, the tree swallows were swooping over my head aggressively. Um, realize that they haven't invaded our city we're walking through their home. Uh, they don't see town lines. They don't see a city as um, you know, not a wild place. They just see buildings as structures that humans create and they are able to adapt. So just realize that animals are wild. Um, keep your distance uh, specifically with um, the top four rabies carrying species in Massachusetts. That is the raccoon, the skunk, red fox, and all species of bats. So extra caution around them because those zoonotic illnesses, as we know, are uh, nothing you want to catch. Uh, if anything seems unusual as far as wild animals in the city, feel free to call the Cambridge Animal Commission because um, sometimes we go out there and the raccoon is fine, just scared in the daytime, but sometimes it is a rabies case and it does have to be captured. So either way, if there's any question about it, let us know um, because we have the education and training to know what's normal and what isn't. And, um, you know, it's a life sport. You can continuously learn about all these different animals. Uh, I've gotten to where I am because every time I don't know something, I look it up, then I know it. Uh, that is great. Thank you so much. Um, so we do have another question, and that is, what is the favorite part of your job to you? All right. I like how it's never the same day twice. I could spend a half a day guarding an owl nest, uh, making a plan and a perimeter for if, if and when an owl falls out of the nest, catching rabid raccoons, um, leading tours 
creating a helping along the volunteer program, getting people involved in the community, uh, visiting schools or having a field trip visit Fresh Pond is a uh, amazing feeling. Uh, developing signs, working on all these um, projects. I just love the diversity and variety I'm afforded to. And uh, because I enjoy it, you know, it stays fresh. That is great. Thank you so much. And with that, we are at time. So thank you, Ranger Tim, for taking your afternoon with us. We very much appreciate it. Um, and for folks who haven't gone to our website yet, Ranger Tim has an awesome video up there about sort of the life cycle of our water, like how it gets from our water source to our homes and to our buildings in Cambridge. So definitely check that out. Uh, and thank you. And, and we'll see you soon. Thank you, Jennifer. Bye. We are in the, the home stretch of our Science in the City Festival, which is an official part of the Cambridge Science Festival. And today we're talking about how science is really embedded in and, and for, uh, formulates, I guess, what we do at the City of Cambridge. So we are going to turn it over to Aidy Filson, who's back again. Uh, for anybody who missed it, you missed a really awesome presentation by her high school interns about biking safely um, in Cambridge. And now we're going to learn about bike physics and the physics behind how our bikes keep going. So I'm going to mute myself and turn it over to Aidy. Awesome. Thanks, Jen. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, I have uh, my cell phone that I'm going to also be using for video demonstrations, so I don't know if that affects the spotlight at all, um, but awesome. So my name is Adie Filson. I'm the Mobility Education Coordinator with the uh, Community Development Department for the city, and um, I'm here today to talk a little bit about some of the science behind bicycles and bicycling. Um, so this is just gonna touch on a few key topics. Um, there's so much that goes into it. I'm sure you could take a full college level class on it, uh, but I wanted to share uh, a couple of things that are really interesting and a couple little experiments that you could do at home. So I say that this uh, presentation is, is uh, targeted towards probably elementary, middle school age level, but uh, I think it, would be interesting for most folks. So, um, so how does a bicycle move? Um, if you were to really break down the movement of a bicycle, what goes into it? Well, I have my bike over here. And actually, let's see, stay muted, cool. So here's my bike on a stand. So what actually makes this bike move? Okay, well, I have the pedal here. It's connected to these gears here. So these are your front gears. And then it has this chain. Okay, what happens if I start pedaling? Okay, the back wheel moves. Does the front wheel move? No, just the back wheel. And you can see this chain moving and it's turning the rear cog here and that's causing the back wheel to spin. Now, if this bike was on the ground, obviously the front wheel would be spinning too, but the go of your bike um, is this cranking motion that turns the back wheel. So, um, so that's pretty cool, but um, what else is needed for your bike uh, in order to function properly? Any guesses, anyone? I'm going to switch back to this screen. Let's see. Um, I'm not sure I can. Oh, here's the chat. There we go. Um, well, so one of the most important things um, is your wheels and because your wheels move your bike. So but what's important in making sure that your wheels are functioning properly? Momentum. Momentum's are really, uh, is really important. Um, so actually before we, we switch over to talking about wheels for a second, I just wanna start off by saying that bicycles are one of the most energy efficient transportation vehicles. 
And when we think about energy efficiency, we're thinking about the amount of energy that goes in versus the amount of energy or the amount or the distance that we get out. So for example, you can see here, um, cycling is one of the most uh, energy efficient. So also 100 calories, so 100 food calories will get to you as a cyclist about three miles but 100 calories for a car would get you only about 280 feet. So that's a pretty big difference. Also, um, one gallon of gasoline will get you 300, or sorry, 3,000 miles on a bike. Um, but depending on how efficient your car is, you know, anywhere but from, I don't know, 18 to 36 miles, I guess. Um, so just for reference, um, it's, 2,800 miles across the country if you were to draw a straight line from the East Coast to the West Coast. So that basically is a cross country trip on, um, on a one gallon of gasoline if you were able to consume a gallon of gasoline. Um, cool. So back to wheels. <laughs> um, so originally, bike wheels were actually created out of wood. Um, and instead of a tire, they had, um, it was just a wooden strip with a piece of iron that was wrapped around um, where you would think of the tire as being. Um, later on, they switched to fully solid uh, rubber tires. And um, those were really popular for a, a long time until about 1890 when John Boyd Dunlop created the first pneumatic tires. And so pneumatic tires means that there's air inside of the tires. And so a really cool fact about this is that, let's see, oh no, my evolution of, there we go. This is the evolution of the bicycle gif, right over, over on the side. Um, so um, a really cool fact is that uh, John Dunlop actually created these tires because his son would get headaches riding the fully rubberized tires. So he came up with the pneumatic tire, a tire with air, in order to solve that issue. So what do you think air, uh, adding air to your tires does for your ride? It makes it a lot more comfortable. You're able to it, it absorb some of the shock from the road. Um, Cool, so um, before we move on to that next part, I'm going to do a little demonstration about uh, tires and air pressure. So um, it's a little hard for me to see this chat. So if there's any questions, um, here we go. I'll let Close. you know. Okay, perfect, well, let's over to the side. Awesome, so, um, um, so, Current, in current times, most or all tires on bikes use air um, and the air goes inside the tire. And in order to get air inside the tire, we need a pump. If any of you have been using a pump at home without a gauge, um, the gauge is this part right here. Um, I highly recommend getting a pump with a gauge. And that's because um, tires are actually specially formulated for certain air pressures. So um, I'm gonna show you this tire right here that I have. So if I spin this around on the side of the tire, it will tell you what the air pressure that the tire is supposed to have. Uh, and it always is a little hidden. Um, here we go, here we go, max. Um, might be a little hard to see, but it says max 120 PSI. Um, so, however, the air doesn't go just inside the tire itself, it goes inside a tube. And this is what a tube looks like. Um, and they're rubber, they're just rubbery and really flat. Um, and if I'm to pump up this tube, let's see if I can do this one handed while holding my phone. Um, so if I pump up this tube, the gauge is going to tell me how much pressure uh, goes is going in to the tire. So I take the tube 
And I'm looking at the gauge here and I'm pumping. Wait a second, nothing's happening to the gauge. But this tube has gotten much, much bigger. So what's up with that? So it's not actually the air that's going into the tube that's creating the pressure, but it's the air pressing against when this tube is inside the tire, the air pressing against the sides of the tire that give it that uh, cause the gauge to have a reading. So that also goes to show um, that when you're pumping up a tire, um, your, I'm gonna switch back to this camera. When you're pumping up a tire, um, you'll notice the needle of the gauge starts, uh, will go way past, will really like shoot up and then fall back down. And with each pump, shoot up and fall back down. And that's a really important um, thing that I always look for because it shows that you have a good connection. So if your gauge shoots up and doesn't fall back down, it means that there's some sort of uh, something stuck in the connection and you should disconnect and reconnect it again. And that's because what causes the gauge to shoot up um, is the initial push of your the pressure that you're pushing into the tire and then it falls down where it's at rest is the pressure that's actually inside the tube and tire itself. Um, so that rise and fall is measuring two different um, forces. Um, so something really cool to watch out for when you are filling up your tires. Um, okay, so Let's see how we're doing on time here. Um, great, so just a little bit on um, bicycling and um, I don't know if you've ever heard this quote from Albert Einstein, life is like riding a bicycle. To keep your balance, you must keep moving. Um, so um, what is it that keeps your bike moving? I have this short little uh, video here that I think we should have just enough time for. Let me make sure that I enabled the sound. Ah. There we go. And I'll skip. Cells. Yes, once they're set in motion at a sufficient speed, bicycles can stay upright without any human intervention. A common misconception is that bikes stay up because of conservation of angular momentum. That is, since the wheels are spinning, if the bike tips to one side, there'll be some sort of countering force from the wheels that keeps the bike upright. But there's an easy way to see this explanation is wrong. Simply lock the handlebars in place, and a moving bike will fall over just as easily as a stationary one. Another common misconception is that bikes stay upright because of their forward momentum. However, if you knock a ghost-riding bicycle sideways, it'll change directions and then continue merrily on its way, plainly changing its momentum but nevertheless staying upright. What we do know about how conventional bikes stay upright on their own is this. When a moving bike starts leaning to one side, it also automatically steers towards that side a little bit. The result is that the wheels come back underneath the center of mass, keeping the bike balanced. And there are three main mechanisms responsible for this. First, because of the backwards tilt of a bike's steering axis, its front wheel actually touches the ground slightly behind that axis. This means that when the bike leans to the left, the upward force from the ground acts to turn the wheel and handlebars to the left, helping the bike steer its wheels back underneath its center of mass. Second, the weight of a bike's front wheel and handlebars is generally distributed slightly in front of the steering axis, so when the bike leans to the left, the downward pull of this mass also helps turn the front wheel to the left, the same way divining rods will turn towards whatever direction you tilt your hands. Third, there is indeed a gyroscopic effect from the wheels, but it doesn't keep the bike upright on its own. Instead, it helps steer. As Destin and Carl demonstrate excellently in this video about how helicopters work, trying to tilt a spinning object makes the object tilt as if you pushed it at a point 90 degrees away from where you did. It seems spooky, but basically the effect of your torque lags behind where you push. Now imagine this happening vertically on a bike, and you can see that the gyroscopic precession from the bike's leftward lean makes the front wheel turn to the left, again helping steer its wheels back 
back underneath its center of mass. In short, a normal bicycle is stable thanks to a combination of the front wheel touching the ground behind a backwards tilted steering axis, the center of mass of the front wheel and handlebars being located in front of the steering axis, and the gyroscopic precession of the front wheel, all of which help the bike automatically steer its wheels back underneath it when it leans, at least when it's moving forwards at the correct speed. If a bike's going too slow, it won't turn quickly enough to keep it from crashing into the ground. And if you push the same bike backwards, the gyroscopic effect will reverse, but the other two effects won't, with the result that the wheels are steered out from under the bike when it leans. What's more, none of these three mechanisms is, on its own, the secret to bike stability. Here is a bicycle that has no gyroscopic effect and whose front wheel touches the ground in front of the steering axis, yet which is stable without a rider. Here is a stable rear steering bike, and here's a design for a stable bike where the steering axis tilts forward instead of back. On the other hand, I made my own bike totally unstable just by adding some extra weight behind the front fork. There are clearly a lot of different variables that can be combined in very- Cool. So I just want to be conscious of time, so I'll leave off here. But if you, um, uh, just to clarify the gyroscopic force, if anyone has a spinning top at home, or if you take a quarter and, um, and flick it or try to spin it really fast, those are really awesome demonstrations of gyroscopic force. And I'm going to put a little YouTube link in the chat so people can check out a really awesome um, and pretty simple demonstration of gyroscopic force with a bike wheel that you can use. Um, and something that you can also do at home is you can feel this gyroscopic, if you have a, uh, if you have a bike at home and you take off one of the wheels and you hold it and you spin it and you get some momentum and then you and then you rotate it, you'll feel that gyroscopic force kind of pulling against you as you spin it. So really cool uh, real life demonstrations of physics concepts. So that is all I have for you today. Sorry, that went a little over. Thank you so much, Aidy. And Aidy put in extra effort today because she had to come twice. So we're very, <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Thank you all. Um, otherwise, we are now going to move on to a great presentation by the Cambridge Public Health Department, and it's all about how um, uh, tap water affects your teeth and your dental health, which is just not anything I had ever thought of before until they decided to bring that out. Hi everyone, I'm Marlena Wilson, a dental hygienist from the Cambridge Healthy Smiles program. I'm here to bring you this video in collaboration with the Healthy Eating Active Living program. Both programs are part of the Cambridge Public Health Department. I'm excited to be joining you today and we'll be performing a science experiment that will reveal the acidity of different drinks and the effect they can have on your teeth. I will try to help you make choices that can keep your teeth and your body healthy. Let's get started. The first thing we wanna talk about is that dental health affects your whole body health. That means keeping your teeth strong will help us be able to eat the nutrients we need to keep us healthy. Our growth, strength, and immunity all count on our ability to eat a healthy diet. The drinks we choose affect our teeth too. That's why we need to make choices that build stronger, healthier teeth. Every day we brush and floss our teeth, but is it enough to keep our mouth healthy? Brush and floss away food. Brush and floss away mouth germs called plaque. Brush and floss away acid plaque leaves behind. The mouth is naturally non-acidic environment until plaque forms. We brush for two minutes twice a day before school and before bed. Top and bottom, front and back, inside and outside. Plaque grows to maturity every 12 hours when it can eat the food we leave behind and create an acid. We brush our teeth every 12 hours or two times a day and plaque cannot harm our teeth. But what if we introduce the acid by choosing acidic drinks? Let's do an experiment. We have vinegar, we have water, and we have an antiacid. It will actually help you see the reaction similar to what is happening in your mouth when you leave behind acid on your tooth. Let's take our antiacid and put it in the vinegar. 
Let's take our antacid again and put it in our water. Let's watch the reaction. It's slowly bubbling or wearing away at your tooth. Not different than ocean waves slowly eroding a beach. Your tooth enamel would slowly be eroded or damaged. Well, let's review. Acid attacks teeth, causing erosion. Mature plaque, eat sugar to make acid, which attacks teeth for about 20 minutes. After repeated acid attacks, your tooth enamel becomes weak and a hole or a cavity can be formed. If our diet includes acidic drinks, it increases the damage we do to our teeth, creating more damage. If we choose drinks with sugar, feeding the plaque, again, even more damage can happen. But what can we do about it? Well, it's all about the quantity of the drink, the acidity of the drink, the amount of sugar in the drink, and the timing of how long it is on your teeth. Which drink should we choose? We have so many choices, juices, energy drinks, sports drinks, water, seltzers. Choices we make are based on the taste, what meals we eat, the activities we participate in, or just plain pleasure. By the end of our science experiment, we'll be able to choose drinks that we enjoy and keep our teeth and body healthy. So what is the pH or acidity of common drinks? Dental enamel starts to demineralize at the pH of 5.5. If you look at a pH strip, you can see that neutral is more at a seven. So we wanna pick drinks that are going to be neutral. Let's test out some of the common drinks. I have tea, juice, sports drink, milk, soda, and energy drink. Let's see what the pH strip tells us the acidity is. You dip it in quickly and take it out and you can see the color that it matches up with on the pH strip. On this one here, we're between yellow and orange. Let's mark T as yellow. Still acidic. Next, we're gonna try the juice. The juice strip matches up to be between a one and a two. Definitely orange, more acidic than the tea. The next one we have is a sports drink. Again, we're having it on a one to two definitely orange and acidic. Let's try the milk. The milk is showing as green, much more neutral. Milk is actually something that strengthens your teeth. Let's mark that one as green. Soda. Let's see what the soda reveals. The soda is becoming orange. So between a one and a two. And our last one I have here in this row is an energy drink. Again, the energy drink is showing up orange. So the common drinks we have in front of us that we've all had, really only one is neutral. Some, there's different variations. And if we added um, sugar to some and took away in, in the tea, we put sugar, or maybe in the soda, we just had a diet soda, uh, we'd see different ranges, but mostly the be acidic. I did, Bring out the vinegar, just as a curiosity. That's what we used in our last experiment. And 
and the vinegar shows up to be an orange. So the vinegar is not that different than the other drinks on the table. Isn't a tooth strong? Yes, the tooth is the strongest part of your body. It's stronger than your bones. Yet, drink choices you make can damage the teeth on a daily basis, causing decay and erosion. You need your teeth to last a lifetime. To help neutralize the acid, after we have a drink, remember to sip, swish, and swallow with water and wash away the sugar and acid away. There are benefits to drinking water. If we swish after meals with water, we wash away the food and the plaque. Water helps the body to form saliva, which buffers acid in your mouth. And water helps the body stay hydrated, stay healthy. It regulates our body temperature, cushions our joints, protects the body tissues, and so much more. But are all waters the same pH? Just as you probably suspected, tap water can be different than bottled water. In fact, every bottled water can be a different pH level as well. So let's take a look at bottled water pH. So here we have some samples of bottled waters. I have a seltzer, a flavored water, a vitamin water, a regular bottled water, and then I added in tap water. So we're going to do the same thing as the other experiment, and we're going to take the pH and see what acidity these drinks have. So the seltzer, we take our pH reference, and we look, the seltzer is actually a yellow. It's acidic, but it's not all the way over to the orange. So it's yellow. Let's mark our seltzer. Next, we're going to try our flavored water. Let's try that. The flavored water is going to turn more orange, which is more acidic. It's between a one and a two. That's our flavored water. Let's next try our vitamin water. Vitamin water turned orange right away. So it's definitely an orange, almost, almost a red. So let's put our vitamin water as an orange as well. Next is our regular bottled water. The regular bottled water is a light green, maybe looking more like a four. So let's keep our bottled water as a green. It's a light green. We're getting more neutral. And our Cambridge City tap water is turning bright green as soon as I put it in. And that would be more of a five. So it's green as well, closer to neutral. So we have the seltzer being acidic, but not as acidic as the flavored water and the mineral water. The bottled water being neutral, but not as neutral as our tap water. So all of them are a little bit different. So make sure that when you're looking at your bottled water, that you're checking those ingredients and see what kind of acids in them and then do this experiment at home and see what your choice of water would be.